Good morning, and thank you for attending today's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, and I'm joined today by Council Members Gredenchik, Chin, and Lewis. I got it right today. <laughs> uh, today we will hear from the Department of Buildings, where we will examine components, I'm sorry, of DOB's almost $200 million budget. Afterwards, we'll hear from HPD. We will hear from members of the public. After HPD, we'll hear from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms so we can put you in the queue. We will now swear you in before turning it over for testimony. Thank you. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. 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 Good morning, Chair Cornegy and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined today by Gus Sarakis, the Department's first Deputy Commissioner, and Sharon Neal, the Department's Deputy Commissioner of Finance and Administration. Together, we're pleased to be here to discuss the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget and the Department's progress in meeting its goals. I will also highlight our work over the past year to further improve construction safety, protect uh, tenants from the use of construction as harassment, and to combat climate change. The fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget allocates approximately $199.5 million in expense funds to the Department. Of this funding, approximately $160.4 million is for personnel services, which supports 1,867 positions. And $39.1 million is for OTPS, which primarily supports contractual services, equipment, and supplies. The changes reflected in the Department's fiscal, uh, fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget are associated with facade inspections. The Department received approximately 900,000 in additional funding and 12 positions to double its dedicated facade inspection team. The Department takes seriously its responsibility to hold owners accountable for keeping their buildings safe and code compliant and to enforce the requirements that all facades be maintained and that certain facades be inspected periodically. Doubling the dedicated facade inspection team will also allow us to strengthen our work in this area and means that buildings will be receiving more proactive facade inspections. We look forward to bringing these additional inspectors on board as soon as possible. I would now like to highlight some of the department's work over the past year. The department continues to make tremendous progress in improving services to our customers and protecting the public by vigorously enforcing the laws and reg regulations that govern the more than one million buildings, uh, including their boilers and elevators, and 50,000 active construction sites under its jurisdiction. Despite the progress we have made, we're going to do more for New Yorkers. We're going to double down on construction safety, hold our licensees and permit holders accountable, ensure that tenants are safe in their homes, whether there is construction in their building or not, and work to reduce carbon emissions from our buildings, all while providing the best in customer service to those members of the public who conduct business with us. In fiscal year 2019, over 106,000 construction jobs were filed with the department, and we issued approximately 181,000 initial and renewal construction permits combined. There were more construction jobs filed and permits issued in fiscal year 2019 than in, in the previous year. Despite the slight uptick in construction activity, our plan review times remain well below targets. The time it took to complete our initial plan review for new buildings, major renovation, and minor renovations decreased across the board. We are completing our initial plan review for the new buildings in less than five days, for major renovations in five days, and for minor renovations in a little over a day. Our goal is to continue to promptly complete our initial plan reviews and to ensure that customers know what to expect when their plans are being reviewed. We are accomplishing this goal by continuously training our plan examiners and by developing plan exam guidelines for a wide variety of projects which help ensure that the plan review is efficient and consistent. 
The wait time between a development inspection request and an inspection also decreased across the board. The wait time for a general construction inspection was two days and was under three days for electrical or plumbing inspection. This progress on development inspection service levels can be attributed to the efficiencies gained from the implementation of DOB Now inspections, which allows for nearly all types of development inspections to be scheduled online. This makes it easier for our customers to schedule inspection appointments, offers more precise inspection scheduling, and improves inspection tracking and notifications. Now concerning development, the department continues our efforts to maintain the city's construction codes. Thank you all for your incredible partnership on this effort, as it would not have been possible without the support of this committee and all of the stakeholders who are involved in our code revision process. Together, we have already updated the city's plumbing code, and just last week, this city council approved our most stringent energy code yet. This means we are bringing the best in energy efficiency to our buildings, which results in energy savings for building owners and lower carbon emissions. We are in the midst of revising the balance of the construction codes and electrical code, and we expect to submit that later this year. In line with our responsiveness as it relates to development, we are responding to complaints from members of the public faster than ever before. Despite receiving nearly 104,000 311 complaints last year, we are responding to the most serious complaints, priority A complaint, complaints, which are those complaints that relate to conditions that may present an immediate threat to the public within seven hours. We are responding to priority B complaints, which capture violating conditions that, if occurring, while serious, do not present an immediate threat to the public within 11 days. As a result of responding to these complaints and our proactive inspections concerning construction safety and tenant protection, which I'll discuss momentarily, we issued nearly 90,000 violations last year. Keeping the public safe is at heart of what we do, and we are committed to holding bad actors accountable for their actions. Construction safety continues to be a focus of this department. Construction-related injuries decreased over 20% last year compared to previous years. This decrease in injuries comes after the launch of our Construction Safety Compliance Unit, which is dedicated to conducting proactive, unannounced inspections of large construction sites citywide. The CSC unit will have over 70 dedicated inspectors when fully staffed, to date, the CSC unit has conducted over 29,000 proactive inspections at over 13,000 unique construction sites, issuing 3,273 stop work orders and 14,541 violations. The decrease in incidences and injuries also coincides with the implementation of Local Law 196 of 2017. Currently, workers at many construction sites are required to have 30 hours of safety training, and supervisors at those sites are required to have 62 hours of safety training. When fully phased in later this year, Local Law 196 will require that workers have 40 hours of safety training. Since the enactment of this law, we have conducted extensive outreach to the construction industry, including directly to workers who are impacted. Our staff has visited over 1,000 construction sites to conduct direct outreach to workers in all five boroughs. We also ran educational advertising campaign that targeted construction workers and included television, radio, and subway ads. We also released our site safety construction map, which is an interactive map workers can use to determine whether a construction site requires site safety training. I'm proud to report that our approved course providers have issued nearly 72,000 site safety training cards and, thousand, and many thousands of OSHA 30 cards to workers, which means that workers are receiving the site safety training required by this law. We are pleased with the compliance we are seeing on the ground. To date, our inspectors have found 289 construction sites out of the over 13,000 sites visited where 600 workers did not have their required training. This resulted in the issuance of nearly 2,400 violations to owners, contractors, and employers, for which over a million dollars in penalties has been collected. The department is also hard at work at protecting tenants, whether they're living in buildings under construction or not. We have already implemented over a dozen laws aimed at combating the issue of construction as harassment. 
The department is now prioritizing its inspection of work without a permit complaints related to construction work in an occupied building, is requiring more detailed tenant protection plans, is performing more proactive inspections to ensure that tenant protection plans are being complied with, and is auditing more professionally certified uh, applications for work in occupied buildings. This work will continue as the department is in the midst of implementing a dozen more laws aimed at protecting tenants. Most importantly, these laws will give us the ability to shift the burden of creating and submitting a tenant protection plan to the department to contractors retained by building owners. Given that contractors are performing the work, they are in a far better position than owners to determine the means and methods for protection, protecting tenants from construction. This reform will greatly improve the quality of and compliance with tenant protection plans. We are also focused on strengthening our Office of Tenant Advocate, which serves as a resource to help tenants understand the laws that govern construction, to investigate complaints of construction as harassment, and to act as our liaison to tenants with, the department, uh, with any department-related issues. To accomplish this, we have reorganized our Enforcement Bureau, now the Office of Tenant Advocate and the Real-Time Enforcement Unit, which is tasked with responding to work without a permit complaints from occupied multiple dwelling buildings report to our buildings marshal. By working in tandem, these units will provide our tenants with the resource they need to navigate the laws that are in place to protect them and respond to any issues they may have expeditiously. The department is also preparing to fulfill its obligation to address greenhouse gas emissions from, coming from buildings. We are well positioned with the largest energy team anywhere in the country to support the city's goal of achieving carbon neutrality. In addition to enforcing the energy code, enforcing existing laws that require certain buildings to report their energy and water use and to perform retro commissioning, we are also implementing the historic Climate Mobilization Act. The Climate Mobilization Act includes Local Laws 92 and 94 of 2019, which require all new buildings and existing buildings undergoing certain major roof renovations to install solar photovoltaic systems, a green roof system, or a combination of the two, and Local Law 97 of 2019, which regulates greenhouse gas emissions from large buildings. We look forward to updating this committee as the implementation of these laws progress. We recognize the significant impact that our work can have on the public, whether they are planning a construction project, attempting to resolve a violation, or wanting to find out more about construction work in their community. As such, we are focused on making our work accessible to the public by providing them with resources they can use, conducting outreach directly to impacted members of the public, and going into their communities to provide assistance. I would like to highlight a number of our efforts in this area. <clears throat> We've released a real-time map of after-hour construction work so that the public is aware of after-hour construction in their neighborhoods and can easily determine whether the work they see or hear has the proper permits. We've started mailing letters to property owners when their neighbor is conducting construction work so they're aware of that work and any disruptions it may cause them. We've created a brochure to help our small businesses understand the laws and regulations that apply when they're installing a business sign. So far, we've distributed over 8,000 of these brochures to over 2,000 businesses. We have recently launched a new initiative to educate small property owners on how to address violations and avoid penalties. Now, when a small property owner receives a violation from the department, we are mailing them a brochure that advises them of their violation and how to resolve it so that they can avoid incurring penalties. They're also being provided with contact information for our administrative enforcement unit, which can help them resolve a violation. We will soon be putting even more information in the hands of New Yorkers so that they can better understand the status of their buildings. This includes sharing profiles on individual buildings so owners can be reminded of matters that require their attention, including outstanding violation and missing compliance filings. We are also bringing the department into your communities to assist your constituents with any department-related issue they may have. Our doors in, uh, are open in every borough on Tuesday night for customer service night, and we've started holding office hours in your offices to bring our assistance directly to your constituents. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. I look forward to continuing our work together to improve the department for the benefit and safety of all New Yorkers. I welcome any question you may have. Thank you so much, Commission. It's always good to see you. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Rivera, um, Council Member Perkins, um, Council Member Richie Torres. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to begin with uh, some questions um, that I have. So city funds of a little under a million nine hundred thirty-two thousand were added in fiscal year 2020, and eight hundred sixty thousand were added in fiscal year 2021 through fiscal 2024 for the hiring of 12 positions. These 12 positions are comprised of 11 inspectors and one plan examiner. Can you please provide the committee a description of these added positions and the type of work they will be conducting? Absolutely. So that, uh, as you know, we are increasing our facades team by 12, 11 inspectors and one uh, technical uh, uh, specialist. That additional 11 inspectors will allow us to double our facade inspectorial team. With the doubling of that team, you'll see more proactive in-field visits by the department. We currently review each and every Local Law 11 report that's submitted to the department. We respond to uh, every unsafe notification from a qualified exterior wall inspector, and we already do in-field verification of reports submitted to ensure that the report is truly reflective of the conditions. These additional heads will allow us to be even more proactive so that one in four Local Law 11 buildings is guaranteed a visit from a Department of Buildings inspector to ensure that the report filed accurately depicts conditions, as well as uh, ensuring that instances where this department issues class one violations for facade work, that we get those buildings on a regularly tra uh, uh, tracked schedule of reinspection. So 60 days after that issuance, the department will be out there to ensure that the measures the department called for namely pr public protection are installed 30 days later we'll be re-inspecting to ensure compliance with any other orders that we may have issued and that building will stay on a cycle so we are actively staffing those positions and i'm happy to update the uh, committee um, when those positions have been filled uh, i'm just curious um, with the uh, impending legislation around the use of new technologies i.e drones is this number of staff sufficient to meet the projected need if it were to go into effect? How would this impact this, these hires? How would they be impacted um, by the use of technology going Cer forward? Certainly. So we are supportive of technology, of increasing our use of technology and innovating as long as those tools that we bring on help us meet two goals. One is always efficiency, and two is our primary concern every day, the protection and safety of New Yorkers. So with respect to drones, we look forward to the legislation passing. We also look forward at determining what other tools um, can be used uh, in support of that or in addition of to help uh, ensure efficiency and protection of New Yorkers. But that being said, um, this department will always value the human interaction with the facade to ensure that uh, the conditions are accurately picked up, identified, and where needed, appropriate steps are taken, whether that be protection or orders to owners um, to cure uh, conditions. So I think that any technology can only enhance the work that we're doing and provide more tools potentially to our inspectors, whether they're in the field or uh, in the office uh, for technical reasons. So I just want to state for the record that um, this com my, myself in particular and this committee does not believe that they're mutually exclusive. Uh, we don't believe that uh, drones should supplant the use of hum human beings. Um, we believe that it does enhance and will enhance uh, effectiveness and efficiency, just for the record. Thank you, and we're, we are in support of that position. We look forward to figuring out, as I said, any technology that can help us get there. So how many facades are inspected annually and could you please describe the process uh, for conducting these inspections? 
Certainly, so cycle eight, as you may know, uh, with respect to local law 11, uh, each building is on a cycle for inspection. The uh, cycle period is five years. Each owner has a specific time within that period, a specific sub-cycle to file with us. Cycle eight, which concluded on February 20th, uh, had more than 14,500 buildings in that. Um, when it comes to the actual inspection uh, that is to occur, Owners uh, um, have a qualified exterior wall inspector perform the inspection. Um, we are requiring uh, additional up-close, in-person uh, inspections of the facade, uh, as well as uh, we've made some changes to improve safety uh, by requiring things such as probes to ensure tiebacks are there. So um, the uh, report is submitted to the department by the qualified uh, in uh, exterior wall inspector, and as I noted, the department reviews the reports to ensure accuracy. How many facades receive a safe designation as a result of these inspections, and what constitutes a safe facade? In cycle seven, we had 93% of all buildings filing receive either safe or swamp with, uh, with uh, specifically to safe filings, we had 54% of those buildings filed that safe. Uh, and again, for Local Law 11 Universe, there are three categories for which a report can be submitted, or three designations, I should say, for which a report could be submitted. Safe, unsafe, and swamp. Safe uh, indicates that there are no deficiencies in the building, on the building's facade that require um, maintenance or repair. Swamp uh, indicates there are conditions or defects within that facade that would require uh, attention and repair um, within a year to five year uh, period. And unsafe indicates any deficiencies on that facade where inter intervention is needed within a 12 month period. Just so I know, and just for the record, are there inspections in the outer boroughs, are, do they, are they subject to the same standard? So we have local law 11 buildings in all five boroughs. It is um, height is a, a determining factor. Um, so certainly Manhattan has a fair share of those, but um, uh, local law 11 buildings uh, are in all five boroughs. Thank you. Um, how many facades receive a safe with a repair and maintenance program designation after inspection? So again, in cycle seven, that number was 39%. So with safe, that represents 93% of the filings. What's the, what's the procedure to verify that repairs were made? Absolutely. So uh, the department does do already and has and will continue reviewing uh, reports as they're submitted to ensure that there are no discrepancies that our staff can identify. On top of that, we respond to each and every complaint uh, or notification, pardon me, made by a qualified exterior wall inspector um, when they are performing the inspection and every report that is submitted as unsafe is required to be amended upon completion of work. Of work. And those reports are reviewed by the department. On top of all of that, we are uh, simultaneously doing proactive inspections of uh, reports and proactive audits in field of reports. Would you happen to know what percentage of buildings that are deemed unsafe were generated and or triggered by 311 complaints? I, I don't. Uh, I'm happy to follow up with the committee on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. That, that wasn't a question that was, uh, it just popped in my head that I, I'm wondering how many times someone has intervened just a regular citizen by making a 311, whether it's a, whether it's a tenant in a building who observes something, um, how, how, much are we, how much are we driven by um, uh, complaints? Some of, some of the agencies that we have are largely complaint driven uh, in terms of um, citing things. I was, just, I was concerned. Yeah, and, and we, uh, we remain, the department remains heavily driven by complaints. As I mentioned in my testimony, we received over 100,000 100, um, 311 complaints. Uh, admittedly, facades is not the largest number of complaints we receive. Those tend to be uh, related to illegal conversions. Um, but I'm certainly happy to come back to you with, with that number. 
Um, so I have one more question before I pass to uh, my colleagues who are here. Um, what is the department's stance on the use of drone technology to assist in performing facade inspections? You alluded to the fact that you were generally supportive. As, um, yes, as I, as I alluded, the department is supportive of any technology, be it drone or otherwise, that allows us to become more efficient and ensures and maintains the safety of all New Yorkers. Um, in, in the idea that it's, you know, that we need to move to a technology um, assisted uh, program, has the department done any initial research on the implementation of it or, or do we wait until it, it, it's, it's um No, we've heard law. from a number of different operators who have expressed interest in working with the department as we explore this, and certainly looking for opportunities to work with any um, partner agencies where they may have property that could be uh, used to explore any technology um, with respect to exterior uh, facades. Uh, one of the concerns that has been mentioned around the use of drones has been centered around cost. Have you done any cost analysis in the use of drone technology? We have not. We've had uh, a number of conversations with operators and industry members who are using technology, be it drone or otherwise, um, to uh, work and explore the potential of that with respect to facade, uh, you know, identification uh, issues um, for defects. Um, or any other sort of iteration. So we haven't done cost uh, yet, but we're starting those conversations. Uh, thank you. So we have up first for questions, uh, Barry Gedentrick. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Commissioner. It's always good to see you. It's always good to see a person from Queens uh, behind that desk. I, I just have a very quick question. Um, we had spoken a while back, um, some of my community boards, um, you know, the nagging issues that they have with um, DOB issues, not that they're nagging DOB, but, um, and they had asked, a few of my boards had asked for the possibility of having um, their own inspector, you know, and uh, for a half a day. Um, we making any progress on that? We are making some progress. I don't have the ability to tell you yes or no yet, but we are still looking at it. Obviously, I want to ensure and protect our service levels um, and responsiveness to complaints, but certainly appreciate, as a former community board member, the role community boards have in wanting to ensure they're empowered uh, to engage with us directly. I thank you. I thank you very much. That's all I have today. Thank you very much. Uh, so I do want to, for my colleagues, let them know that I did have the opportunity to put you all on a timer, so I did not, so I'm asking you to be on your best behavior. Carlina Rivera. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'll try to look at the time. So thank you, thank you for being here. I have a question on AHV first. I noticed you said you had the real-time map so that people can look at exactly where after hours variance permits are. Since you've launched the real-time access, have you noticed a decrease in the complaints or have complaints remained the same? Uh, generally, generally speaking, the complaints are uh, uh, remaining the same. But in addition, and I neglected to mention it, and that's my fault, uh, in addition to the after hour variance map that we believe very strongly in, in increasing transparency across the board for the department, we are also um, providing the council directly with um, uh, AHVs within the borough that they represent. And so that update is happening on a weekly basis as well. That's great. I, I ask because I do have a bill that would try to look at when it's non-vital construction, whether or not we can, I guess limit the number of AHVs that are issued because Manhattan is disproportionately affected considering how much construction and we do have a very high number of noise complaints directly related to it. So I, I know that we haven't had a hearing yet on the bill but I'm hoping that the chair will be moved by this discussion. So I just wanna ask a couple more questions, I'll be very quick. And so in August last year, there was a tragic death in a residential building elevator at 344 Third Avenue in my district. And you were very, very responsive in having a discussion with me right away on how the investigation was going. So I thank you for that. 
and it occurred after DOB issued fines to the building management for failure to ensure elevator safety and had even shut down one of the elevators for similar reasons. However, the building management company clearly didn't take the complaints of the residents or fines from DOB seriously enough. Are the enforcement tools that DOB has for elevator safety enough for building managers to comply? Uh, yes, so I, I just want to be very clear. Elevators continues to remain one of the safety, safest ways to travel in the city. And obviously, anytime there is a fatality, an injury to the member of the public or to a construction worker, that is a very bad day for this department as well as the city. So I don't want to leave unspoken the fact that any death is one too many. With respect to this incident, we are not done with our investigation. We expect to have that shortly, but I will say this. Um, there are 70,000-plus uh, 70, passenger elevators in this city uh, with over a billion trips. So uh, elevators remain one of the safest ways to travel. Um, we'll continue to look at any opportunity we have to ensure further protections if needed. So as a result of the accident, DOB actually had an attendant ride the elevator with residents every time they were in the elevator and keep a log of any incidents and inconsistencies. Is this log book going to be public information? Will it ever be shared with residents? And what does it take to need this kind of oversight? So again, the, uh, the incident is we're not done with the investigation. I'll have to come back to you on the log books and whether that will be made public. The goal there, and I just want to be clear, this is a two elevator building. The goal there was to ensure that the department um, could uh, monitor very directly, very closely the uh, elevator and ensure that it was being operated correctly, that there were no instances of um, overloading uh, of the elevator. So that move was done directly to ensure the protection, continued protection and safety of those occupants in that building. Um, so I'll follow up you, with you on, on the logbook part. Thank you. And, and my last question is on the Office of the Tenant Advocate, which you did mention in your testimony as well. Um, we know that construction harassment could lead to all types of health and safety issues, such as lead poisoning, and can clearly be a warning sign for illegally converting units out of stabilization. So OTA refers cases to building marshals for inspection, leading to many stop work orders. So do you have any metrics on how many more stop work orders are issued on a year-to-year -year comparison since the introduction of the OTA? I don't think I have the stop work number, but uh, let me just say on OTA, because this is an area that's very near and dear to my heart, we did bring on a new executive director of OTA who brings 20, over 20 years of experience in tenant advocacy, leading one of the city's larger tenant organizing and advocacy groups that did not only organizing advocacy but oversaw uh, legal services to tenants. So this is an area of a cr increased attention for this department, an area that will remain a commitment of ours. Um, and we did move OTA into enforcement for um, two reasons. One, because it belongs in enforcement, and two, because we need to provide uh, tenants with the opportunity to get direct access to the folks who are doing the inspections and ensure that OTA acts as a one-stop shop um, for our, our tenants and our residents of this city. So um, we're, we're pretty pleased with the way OTA is going. They'll continue to grow in their mission um, mm -hmm. because certainly you point out tenant uh, construction is harassment. That is true, that is real. Um, but I want OTA to be a real service for tenants who are experiencing any building related issue, whether it be uh, during active construction or otherwise. If the construction harassment inspection shows or leads to other violations, do you coordinate with HPD to conduct their own inspections? Do you do a joint multi-agency action? And does OTA provide additional support to the tenants, such as legal services? And, and thank you so much for your graciousness, Mr. Chair. So uh, we definitely have and will continue to do joint inspections with OTA. Our OTA team is in ver very regular communication, as is members of our legal uh, team as well as they both were collectively on tenant related matters. We've had a number of instances recently where 
um, uh, buildings that are occupied have had significant structural challenges where we've taken a very coordinated approach um, with OTA, with legal, with HPD, to in, and with the mayor's office to protect tenants and Jackie Bray's team to ensure that the city collectively is <clears throat> marching forward together, unified, and where we can, this department has actively stepped up to ensure that tenants and electeds are aware of a situation that is you know, either occurring or may occur, and that legal representation, while we can't provide that to tenants, we are certainly conscious of the fact that that is a critical step to ensure that tenants are protected in the long haul. Well, thank you. Um, I look forward to the follow-up information, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, Margaret Chen. Uh, I'm sorry. Also, we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. It's good to see you, and thank you for your support in my district. Um, even my staff is uh, very happy with quick response. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I, so I have a, a, just a couple of questions. Um, I know my colleague, Councilman Rivera, asked about, you know, after our variance, and especially in Manhattan, we just have so many of them. And so do you track, um, in terms of the, the number of days, do they really need those uh, um, you know, extend the time, and also, I think the majority of the after hours are you cite, you know, public safety. Can you give us um, an example um, of what that could be? Certainly. So, um, this department definitely recognizes the challenges that communities face. Particularly, I think I have a, a unique perspective in after hour variance, given that I started my career at the city council, dealing with constituents, moved over to school construction where we were um, uh, users of after hour variants uh, for some of our projects and certainly now at the department seeing both sides and needing to ensure things progress safely. It is our opinion that after hour variances um, are required. We certainly want some work to occur after hours where it is safer um, for the community, things like um, crane jumps where you don't want that occurring, crane assembly where you don't want that occurring. Some work does necessitate longer time periods beyond the traditional work hours. Um, and, and we do uh, review all of our initial uh, AHVs that come in. So we are monitoring the after hour variance. Again, we are committed to transparency and ensuring that the information we have is available and shared. Um, so that everybody is uh, aware of what is occurring in their community. So do you do any like proactive inspection um, on some of the, the one that keep asking? Yes. We do two things, council member. We do in-field verification um, through our after our variance unit who is uh, proactively auditing um, uh, these sites as well as responding to complaints the department receives. So we are doing those in real time. Uh, additionally, um, we are doing desk reviews uh, and audits of AHVs as well. So this is an area that we are certainly aware of the concerns, um, and we, we again want to ensure that work can continue safely. And I recognize uh, certainly the, the concerns that you and others on this committee and, and in this council have uh, with AHVs. One of the issues that we hear um, you know, from constituents and also, you know, um, it's related to commercial building. Um, this is, these are not new construction, they're renovation. And especially in Low Manhattan, a lot of these big office building now are being converted into residential. So in terms of really the after hour variance, noise, and the other thing is crushing of the debris that they bring out. Um, and that's the question I uh, asked yesterday uh, in the sanitation committee. It's like, who has oversight uh, of these commercial carters that actually crush the materials in front of the building uh, during the day and into the evening? Um, some of them, the workers doesn't wear protective gears and pedestrian walking by gets all this, you know, materials that breathing in and also people who live in, in the neighborhood because especially in low Manhattan is more and more residential. So does the building department 
provide like proactive inspection on these renovation sites to make sure that they are complying and not creating a uh, hazardous situation uh, to the public? Yes, very much so. So um, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a proactive uh, team of inspectors who do, as I mentioned, proactive inspections, and that's all they do. Um, and they do so in sites where safety protections are required. So some alteration work of a large enough scale certainly could qualify for that. So I'm happy to have a follow-up conversation with you on the specifics of, of this. I mean, it sounds like you have specific locations. So let's talk a little deeper on some work that maybe the department can do more of um, around commercial conversions, um, particularly on the, on the waste removal and debris removal. So do you have a list of all the commercial buildings that are undergoing uh, renovation? Because like we have one right now on um, 30 Wall Street. That's, sure. The union is protesting. There's right. a, I'm getting noise complaints from my constituents, but one of the things that the union raised was they're doing renovation inside, right. and they're creating and they're crushing materials right on the sidewalk. I'm happy to get you a list of all the active permits for commercial property in your district, and we'll have a follow-up conversation, uh, if you'll indulge me, on, on the work that's happening specifically with respect to Yes, uh, I, I would definitely appreciate that. And my last question is your the Office of Special Enforcement. I think they go out and they, they do, uh, in especially the illegal uh, short-term rental, the Airbnb. Um, what about... You know, like if um, some residential buildings, you know, they're doing renovation because, you know, a tenant move out and they're doing renovation, but some of them are actually doing some illegal conversion. Are the building department, like the permit that you give, do they give you specific information about whether they're just doing uh, a renovation, you know, of a, a one bedroom apartment, but in reality, they're converting that apartment into a two-bedroom apartment. Yeah, so all, all applications for work um, uh, in, this, in this area that you're talking of would denote the scope of their work. So we do have the scope. Typically what we find are, um, particularly as you mentioned, illegal conversion, which continues to be one of our top uh, areas of complaints received uh, to the department. Um, it twofold, right? There are concerns that there is illegal conversion that has already taken place, and therefore, you know, you see a one-family home or a uh, an apartment um, uh, subdivided to uh, create SRO units or smaller smaller housing units. Um, and then there's a concern that you mention or that you're alluding to, which is that work is submitted, plans are submitted to the department, and work is occurring uh, that is contrary to that. So uh, yes, we respond to every single illegal conversion complaint. Yes, we respond to each and every complaint of work contrary or work without a permit. Um, and we do review plans to ensure compliance. Um, but again, I, I have to acknowledge that illegal conversion is one of our top complaints uh, received and an area that we uh, 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 provide significant uh, resources to with respect to inspections. Do you only respond to complaint or do you do surprise audits? Or like look at the people who kind of file um, permits for work and if they're filing a lot in terms of in one building, or do you do some kind of like special audit uh, so we inspection on, yes. on those? So we have a very robust uh, audit process that includes looking at plans, um, uh, auditing plans in each and every single borough, auditing uh, within certain depart uh, units in the department, doing audits based on complaints, uh, as well as referrals from our own uh, inspectors who have gone out to the field who may see something. So the audit uh, process is quite robust. It is ongoing continuously, and there are some very significant penalties where uh, that our uh, registered design professional or license holders uh, face should they um, submit false information to the department. Good. Uh, yeah, from your testimony, you you are doing a lot, and we just want to make sure that this is budget hearing, that you have the adequate resources. So in your new needs, are you putting in for extra staff in certain departments to really help you accomplish 
you know, all the goals and work that you, you want to do. I, I appreciate the recognition of the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, every member of the Department of Building is a, a leader in their field and I feel very strongly that the entire team is made up of incredibly dedicated people who really take seriously the mission of the department and ensuring the safety of all New Yorkers. Um, at this point, we're having conversations, certainly. We'll keep you uh, informed, uh, but we believe our service levels are world-class, um, very strong given the volume of work and the city of this size. So we're, we're quite pleased with our service levels. We obviously are always looking for improvements uh, in our ability uh, to serve our customers. Thank you. Just one last question that came, because I have a lot of tall buildings in my district. So in terms of the facade inspection, is that creating a lot of difficulties um, for the building department to really like make sure the, that these buildings are safe? Our, our facades unit is uh, dedicated literally to facades as they're the facades unit, um, but they're quite versed in buildings of all type uh, and they deal very extensively with some of our largest and tallest buildings. So that team is, is a, a class act uh, on their own. So I feel very good about their abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We've been uh, joined by Councilmember Joni. Councilmember Lewis, did you have a question? Uh, we had another question by uh, Councilmember Rudenchik, who's still here, so you sure? Okay, no problem. So I'm going to move to a few more questions I had, and some of them are um, around Councilmember um, Rivera's questions. So in December, 20, just for context, in December 2018, DOB launched the Office of Tenant Advocate, OTA, established by Local Law 161 of 2017, which serves as a resource to tenants who are affected by work and occupy multiple dwellings. The fiscal 2021 preliminary plan budgets for two positions in fiscal 2021. The fiscal 2020 adopted budget did not include any budgeted positions for this office. Could you please describe these positions and their role in performing the duties of OTA? So our OTA team, as I mentioned, is headed up by a new executive director. OTA consists of the executive director and a tenant liaison, but very importantly, they are part of a team that uh, represents over 100 uh, Department of Buildings staff, including inspectors. OTA exists within our enforcement team um, and is part of our uh, Buildings Marshall universe. And so we have a, a coordinated approach that includes Building Marshalls, uh, OTA, real-time enforcement, all working together to advance tenant protections. Does the department expect OTA's workload to increase considering the continual increase of construction-related activity? Uh, certainly for uh, OTA, we, we hope that their workload grows as they deepen their connections in communities with local elected officials and local tenant organizations. So that is certainly a hope of the department. But I will say our service levels, our response times are very strong for OTA. We're responding to tenants in uh, approximately a day and a half. And where incidences or issues require an inspection, we're able to make that inspection within a day. So we feel very confident that we have the staff ability to respond to tenants. Um, I'll come back to some more questions I have right now, uh, Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Good uh, morning, Commissioner. Um, Good morning, Councilmember. As of December 2019, the department was operating at 13 percent vacancy rate. Can you explain where the, why we have such a high vacancy rate, which I believe is amongst the highest of all city agencies, where those vacancy headcounts are, and what impact it's having on um, your agency or department to fulfill its obligations because of the vacancies? So I'm happy to report that we are, our vacancy rate is 11% as of today. Um, which I acknowledge is, as you, you, you correctly pointed out, we have a, a higher vacancy rate than some others in the city, but our vacancy rate is going in the right direction. A couple of things to, uh, to note. Over the last number of years, this department has grown tremendously, and that has been certainly part of the challenge of ensuring lower vacancy rates. And it's worth recognizing that the construction industry continues to remain quite strong, and so that presents 
uh, a challenge in retention and recruitment. So it's about salaries? No, I wouldn't say it's about salaries. I mean, we're all public employees and we enjoy some benefits of being a public employee. But again, we're, we're talking about, particularly in the inspectorial side, we're talking about a very specific set of qualifications that we um, are seeking to bring on for our field inspectors. And when you have the, the economy this strong, there tends to be an interest to want to remain in the field in your very specific trade. And that's all fine and well. We certainly look forward to those members joining the department in a new role uh, for the department on, on the inspection side. So um, lots of things contribute to the vacancy. The economy remains strong. Um, uh, the construction sector remains strong. And that is but one challenge. In other words, it's about salaries. It's in the free markets, it's called being competitive and you have to draw them in, and that would mean a salary increase. But where are those vacancies currently? So our vacancies uh, are, let me get that for you, I have them. So our vacancy rate, again, as I noted, agency-wide is 11%. Within in our inspectorial universe, we are at 15% vacancy, so 113 headcount there. Wow. Our plan examiner side, much lower, 5% vacancy. Uh, Number? 5% vacancy. A head count. Uh, 19 staff. 19 down. And plan examiners. Uh, within our administrative management level, we are at 11% or 54 head count. And finally, within our clerical, 7% or 18 positions. So the two categories that are important and significant to me, and I would imagine many of my colleagues, is plan examiners and inspectors. 113 inspectors down is a significant number, and plan examiners of 19 is significant. Let me just note our, as I mentioned previously to Councilmember Chin, our service levels remain incredibly strong. When you think about the volume of work in the city, uh, we are averaging five days for initial plan review for large jobs, that is a tremendous um, service level uh, for this for city, for, for this city or any city. And I would compare this department's customer service and service levels to any department of buildings across the country. When you look at the development side, to say that you can call uh, f uh, you know, for an inspection and see a DOB inspector on the development side, so these are your construction sign off, your plumbing, your electrical sign off, uh, within a matter of a day or two, tremendous. That is, that is world-class service levels. So I acknowledge our, our vacancy rate, um, but I believe the department is fulfilling its mission. So if you feel comfortable, I mean, it's your department, your agency, and you think that you're, even though you have 11% vacancy, that you can fulfill your obligations, that's great. I guess moving forward, we can reduce the headcount needs and the budget. If that's the, if you're operating at an efficient and optimal mode. Happy to have the conversation and keep you in the loop on how we're doing with filling the positions. It's worth noting also, and I, I, I would be remiss for not noting this, we are thankful for um, our, our partnership with the council and uh, legislation passed to allow us to broaden our qualification experience to help recruit additional inspectors and we're proud of those level one inspectors that we brought on, 14 of which were a direct result of, of that legislation, so. Of the 113, are any of these vacancies related to elevator inspectors? With respect to our elevator uh, department, we have uh, seven vacancies within elevators. What is the total number of, what is that percentage wise? For elevators, that represents uh, 15%. That's a high number. We know that we have concerns with uh, the elevator um, inspections and um, the dangers that exist and some of the tragic incidents we've witnessed as well as the hardship that residents face when elevators are not out and they're not running optimal. Um, again, all of these positions are important. You know your agency and your department. If there's an emphasis on uh, priorities, I would imagine that would definitely be one, as well as construction site safeties and uh, all of the other um, 
needs that we have for our inspectors, but this is budget season. And if it's about getting the support that you need sure. from the city council, this is when it's done best. So, and I appreciate this committee's strong support of my agency. Can you assure us that we would be focused on especially those elevator inspectors? We are 100% uh, focused on reducing our vacancy and certainly targeting the inspectorial universe. As I did note, our vacancy rate is going in the right direction. We are not there yet, but it is certainly moving in the right direction. But I do also want to underscore, because we are talking about elevators, and it's incredibly important for me to say this, elevators remain one of the safest ways to travel in this city with over 70,000 devices and billions of trips. Elevators continues to remain one of the safest ways to travel. Thank you. I've never heard of an elevator ride referred to as a trip. Thank you for that, Commissioner. I, I will, let alone be in one of the safest methods of travel, I'm pretty impressive. Uh, kudos to you on that. Thank you, Council You threw Member. me off topic, but I, um, Chairman, did you mention the coronavirus and the role that the Buildings Department can play as we start addressing this? Uh, okay. Uh, so that if, with your permission, do you believe Department of Buildings should play a role when it comes to educating and coming up with protocol and procedure in case of a citywide outbreak, specifically in and around not only your own agency departments and the massive amount of people that visit Department of Buildings in each borough, uh, what it could mean uh, for an exposure, uh, as well as from a multiple dwelling what do you envision the role of your department could be to, one, inform residents, two, property owners and managers on how to prevent the spread, uh, especially when it comes to one common entrance, mm -hmm. one common elevator, or the method of travel, as you preferred to refer to. Um, if you're all pressing the same buttons, and we know that surface to surface, the surface contamination is a real factor in the spread. Um, one buzzer system, one door to open, push Understood. open, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we are, we have already started communication, not only obviously with our internal staff to the department to ensure that they have all the information they need, but uh, uh, to the public who um, come to visit the department. As you know, we're in every borough. Um, and so we're engaging with our customers, our members of the public who are visiting the department and ensuring that we're sharing this information as, uh, to them as well. On top of that, we are obviously working very closely with uh, DOHMH, uh, DCAS, as there are landlord in many of our facilities, uh, as well as our partners at EM and other agencies to see how we can best facilitate and act as a, a vehicle of information sharing um, and, and outreach. Do you foresee uh, procedures um, that you may be able to provide these tenement buildings or office buildings and commercial buildings as to how to keep surfaces clean and a recommendation on how many out often to wipe them down and perhaps posting a notice on the user? Uh, some of our intercom systems require handsets sure. that people put to the ear and mouth. Uh, as well as touching? We're, we're, as I mentioned, we're actively working with DOHMH and where our inspectors who are in the field in every community um, can be a resource for the city in its efforts to ensure that that kind of communication, collaboration, and outreach is happening. We'll certainly make sure we're doing our role. And just to follow up on HVAC systems, I'm not sure if that is now a concern when it comes citywide uh, as far as the spread of the contamination. Um, the inspectors that would have to be out there looking at these filter systems, are they optimal? Have they been replaced? Are they the ducts clean? And I haven't uh, heard that concern expressed from DOH, but again, we're having conversations, and if anything changes from what I said, we'll share that to the committee thank and to you, you Council Member. Thank Look, you. Continue looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to have, um, just on construction inspections, in 2019, how many inspections were completed for electrical systems, construction work, plumbing, and gas work? So in 2019, we completed one, uh, 
156,933 inspections, of which 77,140 were electrical, 36,238 were construction, and uh, the remaining 43,555 uh, were plumbing. As a fiscal 2021 preliminary budget, what's the associated headcount for inspectors for these categories, budgeted and actual? As of our preliminary 2021, the uh, actual uh, headcount is 140, 47 in electrical, 35 in construction, and 58 in uh, plumbing. Uh, that budgeted headcount is 166 with 56, 42, and 68, respectively. I'm just curious as to what the, um, the strategy is for getting those numbers uh, budgeted and actual to be the same. As I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we have had some success in increasing the diversity of our pool um, as part of our uh, level one uh, uh, inspectors that we've brought on. So we started bringing on those um, inspectors with a diversified set of requirements or qualifications in December. We had 14. In uh, We have an academy class starting this month. We'll increase that number. So that's part of the puzzle. The other piece is continuing to ensure that we have outreach into the industry through you know traditional job fairs where we're seeking to bring on new staff. Another part of the puzzle is really looking at our youth to try to encourage and promote a diverse set of understandings of potential future employment opportunities. So we're very excited about our youth programming, making sure uh, kids in our public schools, in our CTE programs, have a very tangible sense of what could be out there. And we certainly hope they come work at the department um, when they're old enough. Um, so all of that together really helps drive down. And as I mentioned, our vacancy rate is moving in the right direction. So I just want to state also for the record, whatever we can do to help promote those availabilities, especially for our youth, um, we'd gladly like to partner in that way. Absolutely. And then last, uh, are, these, are these sufficient resources to carry out inspections given the high rate of construction citywide? I, th I mean, I obviously know the answer to that. But. I mean, as I mentioned, our, our development inspection wait times are, I, I don't know how many, how many more... Uh, Effusive words I could use, but they're phenomenal. They're, you know, for a city of eight million plus residents to say that you have a wait time of two days, one day, you know, two and a half days. That is, uh, uh, you know, that team does does a phenomenal job. That being said, we obviously look at every unit to ensure that they're the most efficient and where we have needs. We certainly will engage in those conversations. Um, you mentioned in your testimony your commitment and the, the agency's commitment to safety. I think we share that commitment um, as the chair and as the, you know, the committee also shares that commitment. And I just want to state for the record that I appreciate that. Thank um, you. I believe that over time we've seen a decrease in accidents. We've had some real tragedies, though, as we closed out 19 and we began 20. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work within the context of what the law prescribes to make sure that there is safety. Thank you, Council um, Member. And then my last uh, uh, round of questions is about DOV now. The fiscal 2021 preliminary bud plan allocates $10.5 million to DOB now with an associated headcount of seven positions. Could you please provide a breakdown and description of the full year positions under the DOB now project? A. What is the actual headcount for the DOB now project? You know, I actually don't have that number. Let me follow up with you. Sure. Uh, what products and or services have been procured for the creation and maintenance of DOB now? So let me just say broadly on DOB now, just as a uh, reminder, uh, DOB now is replacing our 30 year mainframe system biz, which has long exceeded its usefulness. Um, and DOB now does a few things. It is broken up into four parts, build, safety, licensing, and inspections. Once fully implemented, this will allow the department to realize our goal of being fully electronic. 
um, which will add efficiencies back to the industry, no longer needing to come visit us in person while we certainly appreciate that. Um, they're better suited working and, and continuing their business. It will also allow for us as a department to get better data, more granular and specific to the type of work that is occurring so we can reprioritize the way we uh, engage with the industry and target um, potential uh, challenge spots. And lastly, a, a, a uh, not often spoken about part of DOB now is the increased transparency for the end user. So the individual who's paying that design professional or, or contractor to do work in their home or in their place of business, it will afford them the opportunity to know exactly what is happening with their application, whether it was submitted, whether it was rejected with rejected meeting uh, objections submitted back, whether an inspection was ever called for and what the uh, re department's response times uh, were. So very long way of saying we are mid-cycle uh, mid of rolling this out uh, and we'll continue to do so. Specifically though, to your question on the IT budget, uh, we have 24 lines in there for this. So uh, I said that was my last round, but I seriously would be remiss if I didn't touch on just a few questions around construction site safety yes. and compliance. Uh, can you please give an update on the work performed by the department in collaboration with the construction site safety task force? How many construction site safety inspections were performed in 2019? So our work with the site safety ta uh, training task force continues. We had met for the uh, quarterly for the first two years. We're on an annual basis now for the next three. Our next meeting is uh, occurring this summer in June. So we look forward to that. And as you know, that group was instrumental in ensuring the implementation of local law 96, uh, 196, pardon me, and the curriculum as well as hours of training needed. So we're thankful for that work. We're excited to continue that. With respect to uh, inspections conducted in fiscal 19, um, we conducted 14,520 inspections as part of the department's construction safety compliance unit, that group that is re uh, responsible for the 100% proactive inspections. Uh, what percentage of the city's construction sites receive site safety inspections? I, I, you gave me the overall number. I'm just wondering what the percentage is. So uh, there are at any given moment some 6,500 larger sites. We'll get you the percentage as it relates to NBs and large alterations on what that universe is. Uh, okay. How but many? I, I'm sorry. No, please. How many? How many uh, violations were issued? because of these inspections? So our proactive, violation, uh, proactive inspections resulted again in, in fiscal year 2019. Um, the Construction Safety Compliance Unit uh, issued 1,198 violations, uh, which amounted to nearly uh, $2 million in penalties, of which nearly a million has been collected. I, I do want to just note for, uh, uh, for relevancy here, the Construction Safety Compliance Unit is tasked with ensuring that larger construction sites remain safe. Those larger sites are the ones that uh, require safety training. Um, and it is worth noting that since um, 196, Local Law 196 went into effect, we found uh, just 289 sites where 600 workers did not have training. So that is a very um, good number insofar as it is a low number, which to us is showing that the training is occurring. Thank you. Uh, what's the department's process for select, selecting approved site safety training providers? So I'll let Sharon answer that um, question. She is, uh, heads I've been up. dying to hear from Sharon, so. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> hey, good morning. Um, so we actually have a rule you know, on the books which is referred to as our course provider rule and the expectation um, is that entities that are professional training entities either have um, an, accredita an accreditation through uh, accrediting bodies and that they meet the, the requirements of being a legitimate training provider. So that means they hire um, qualified um, instructors that are familiar with adult learning techniques. The training is happening in a classroom. They're using um, appropriate course materials. They're assessing um, 
the, the learning objectives and whether or not the students are learning what they're supposed to learn and also that they're administering their program where they're actually registering people, they're taking attendance. So in, in a, and that's what the accreditation component is supposed to mean across the board. Um, the council expanded the um, provider requirements under Local Law 196 to expand that universe to non-for-profit entities. Many non-for-profit entities um, do um, host a lot of OSHA training, and they do hire OSHA instructors to do the SST training under Local Law 196. Has an audit, has, has there been an audit on those providers? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the um, initial audits are making sure that that, um, that their status is up to date with their accrediting bodies, that they, um, that they are in fact doing the administrative components uh, to run their programs, that they're, um, they have uh, instructors that are doing what they're supposed to do. And we also do have um, the auditing component is done under the Office of the Buildings Marshal. And they've also actually sat in and attended classes to make sure that the class is happening for the full day and that the, you know, the content is appropriate to the course that's being offered. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do you guys have any more questions? So thank you so much, uh, thank Commissioner, you, for, for being here. It's always a pleasure to see you. Likewise. Thank you very much. We'll be taking a uh, two or three minute break to transition from DOB to HPD. And for me to take two bites of my sandwich.
Good morning, and thank you all for attending today's fiscal 21, 2021 preliminary budget hearing. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie. I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joined today by Council Member Chin and Gredenchik. We'll next hear from the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development where we will examine all components of HVD's $1 billion expense budget and $5.7 billion capital budget, along with details and progress related to the administration's housing plan, Housing New York. HPD is now at the halfway mark in terms of the production goals under Housing New York, with about 148,000 affordable housing units financed to date over the life of the housing plan. There's much to celebrate about this level of production, which has exceeded projected targets and production goals. But as the city addresses the complex challenges of producing and preserving quality affordable housing, it does so at a point in time when the population of homeless New Yorkers continues to rise and a shortage of deeply affordable housing units exists within the city's housing market. Further complicating matters is the current federal administration who has continually proposed significant funding cuts to vital housing programs which HPD programs and services utilizes by tenants and homeowners depend on. While the primary focus of Housing New York are tenants and the creation of affordable rental units, there's also a homeownership component to the plan which I would like to shed more light on, especially on opportunities that focus on homeownership and many challenges and barriers that exist with securing affordable homeownership in this housing market. I look forward to working with, your commis with you, Commissioner, and further discussing these complex issues. After HPD, we'll hear from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that would like to testify today to please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms so we can put you on the queue. We will now swear you in before turning it over for testimony. Thank you. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Maybe again. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the New York City Council Committees on Housing and Buildings. My name is Louise Carroll, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD. I'm joined by our Executive Deputy Commissioner, Baba Halm. Associate Commissioner for Financial Management, Rich Johns, and members of HPD's senior leadership team. It has certainly been a busy 10 months since I came on as Commissioner last May. Our agency has focused on improving our programs and processes to better serve the public, and in some cases, changing course as needed. I'm immensely grateful for the talented and dedicated team at HPD who develop innovative solutions to difficult problems while at the same time working tirelessly each and every day to contribute and continue to deliver the safe, quality, and affordable housing that New Yorkers need and deserve. As you well know, the work of our agency is critical to the residents of the city and a top priority of the de Blasio administration. HPD is the driving force behind a coordinated interagency effort to create and preserve affordable housing at a record pace, to support owners in order to enforce tenants' rights to live in safe, quality housing, and to engage in community-focused neighborhood planning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on HPD's fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget and how this funding will help us to achieve our agency's goals. First, I will provide a brief overview of HPD's budget before describing how the agency will be moving forward in creative and ambitious ways in the coming year. I am happy to answer any questions you may have thereafter. As you know, HPD's important work requires significant investment from the city and federal governments. HPD's fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget is approximately $1 billion. However, this includes about $218 million in pass-through funding for NYCHA. So aside from this pass-through funding, HPD's true expense budget is about $782 million for FY 2021. 
Of the 782 million total, approximately 132 million comes from city funds and about 649 million comes from federal funds. That means 83% of HPD's ex expense budget is fund federally funded. This huge portion of federal versus city funding in the city, the, in the agency's budget is important because when we seek to save city tax dollars, as we are constantly trying to do, the amount that we can save is limited. Because so many of our programs are restricted by federal requirements, city funding, especially city tax levy, is critical for flexibility and strengthening areas not otherwise eligible for federal grant funding. Through the Mayor's Housing New York Plan, we are well on our way to meeting the administration's accelerated and expanded goal of producing 300,000 affordable homes by 2026. 2019 was a record year for new construction as well as for homes serving the homeless and those needing supportive services. We financed more than 25,000 affordable homes, bringing us to a total of more than 147,000 affordable homes created and preserved since the start of the administration. Over 40% of these homes are affordable to extremely low and very low income families. And as the mayor said in his State of the City address earlier this year, we are committing to building even more homes for the lowest income New Yorkers. With your home NYC, the next phase of Housing New York, half of all new rentals we fund going forward will serve families making less than $50,000 a year. And at least half of those will be for families making less than $30,000 a year. That means 2,000 2, more homes for extremely low and very low income households. In addition to driving our production toward lower incomes, with Your Home NYC, HPD is taking an interagency approach to tackling some of the city's toughest housing problems. For example, in terms of keeping New Yorkers in their affordable homes, through HPD's preservation work, we have already kept over 245,000 New Yorkers in their affordable homes since the start of this administration. And in the next two years, we project that we will keep at least 75,000 more New Yorkers in their homes and communities. In terms of legalizing basement apartments, now that we've gauged interest and gained insight from our basement apartment conversion pilot program, we will work towards legalizing basement apartments and accessory dwelling units in order to enforce the safety and quality while adding more affordable places for New Yorkers to live. Regarding expanding community land trust and new shared equity models to build neighborhood wealth, we will work with organizations proposing community ownership models that will include enough city-owned land to gain up to 3,000 units of community-owned affordable housing. Pertaining to creating alternatives to security deposits, we will make it easier to offer alternatives to security deposits, starting with our own city-financed homes. In terms of renter protections, we are committed to finding solutions to bring renter protections from arbitrary evictions and steep rent increases to the 2.5 million New Yorkers who live in nearly 900,000 unregulated homes. Through Your Home NYC, we're working in tandem with other agencies to help New Yorkers get, afford, and keep their homes. These new commitments further the work HPD has already done and will continue to do to address the city's critical need for housing. We are always striving to do more, to do better, and to do our work in thoughtful, creative ways. For example, last year, we announced plans for 167 um, affordable homes and a new community medical center that will be constructed using cutting edge modular design. Modular construction brings the latest in innovative design and construction and we're leveraging this technique to build higher quality homes faster and at a lower cost. Also, we're looking to our city owned land for new inspiration. 
while HPD has turned much of its inventory of city-owned land into affordable housing, we're still left with some small, oddly shaped lots. In order to ensure that we're not letting any opportunity escape us, we held an international design competition called Big Ideas for Small Lots with the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, to generate creative housing solutions for these properties. We are working with a finalist to make these ideas a reality and exploring the potential to unlock many more of these challenging lots for affordable housing. But we're not just looking at underutilized city property. Through our Zombie Homes initiative, we track abandoned buildings in terrible condition because we know they threaten the safety and security of our communities and bring down property values in our neighborhoods. This year, we teamed up with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and Restored Homes to hold mortgage holders accountable and design new ways to return these homes to productive use. We're also being responsive to the varied needs of New Yorkers searching for housing. New York is one of the most culturally rich cities in the world, and our housing stock should reflect that diversity. We're working with the winners of Share NYC RFP to explore how a shared housing model can create more housing for small households at deeply affordable levels. Finally, we're making sure that New Yorkers are getting connected to all the affordable housing opportunities we're working to create. This summer, we will launch Housing Connect 2.0, a new and improved system for New Yorkers applying for our affordable housing lottery. Our goal is to make the process clearer, more efficient, and seamless for both applicants and marketing agents. We look forward to working with our housing ambassadors and your offices to make sure New Yorkers know about this valuable resource and have the support they need to truly benefit from the enhanced system. Another top priority of our agency is, of course, to protect tenants by ensuring the quality and safety of their housing. Sometimes that means taking aggressive enforcement actions against bad landlords, but other times it means providing support to property owners who want to do well by their tenants but may not have the means or resources to do so. HPD operates in a number of different ways to accomplish this goal. Every day, Hundreds of HPD inspectors are in apartments across the city, enforcing the Housing Maintenance Code and issuing violations when landlords are not in compliance. Our Housing Litigation Division also brings cases in housing court against owners who do not fix outstanding violations and, when necessary, seeks findings of contempt and incarceration to recalcitrant landlords. Last spring, we went to federal court with the Attorney General to stop the illegal eviction of rent-stabilized tenants in the East Village. And in August, we joined tenants in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, as they petitioned to have a court-appointed administrator take over their building after years of neglect. HPD's new anti-harassment unit also proactively seeks to halt tenant harassment and correct conditions in buildings through the courts. Since its launch in 2019, the Anti-Harassment Unit has performed over 900, 950 building-wide inspections and recommended over 40 comprehensive cases for legal action. The Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants was also established last year, and we're working collaboratively with this office in order to be as comprehensive as possible in our efforts to protect tenants. In addition to these enforcement tools, we have a number of programs that property owners can take advantage of to improve their properties. This past year, we launched our Home Fix program, which provides funding, technical assistance, and counseling to owners of one to four family homes struggling to make needed repairs and otherwise maintain their homes. And as part of Lead Free NYC, we launched an ad campaign in November to inform property owners of the grants and resources HPD offers to help them afford lead remediation. The awareness campaign made it clear that property owners must identify and safely fix lead-based paint hazards in their buildings or face enforcement and penalties. 
This campaign goes hand in hand with the City Council's lead bills recently signed into law, which will help the City crack down on lead paint violations in order to strengthen protections for our youngest New Yorkers. Finally, the third priority for our agency this year stems from our work to engage residents in neighborhood planning efforts to build and strengthen their communities. Over the last two years, HBD worked in partnership with NYCHA and numerous other government and community-based partners to lead an inclusive and comprehensive process to advance fair housing in our city. This year, we released the Where We Live New York City draft plan, which will guide the city's bold and transformative efforts to dismantle the legacy of segregation and discrimination that stand in the way of opportunity for many people in our communities. The Where We Live New York City draft plan includes key goals and strategies, including expanding resources to combat persistent housing discrimination, supporting housing development throughout the city and the region, creating more independent and integrated living options for people with disabilities, and many others that will help guide us in this endeavor. Thanks to our many partners across the city and the 150 organizations that particip participated in our stakeholder group, we are able to work hand in hand with New Yorkers to solidify our next steps to make the city a more fair and just place to live for everyone. We look forward to continuing this conversation with New Yorkers and many of you in this room to carry out the plan once it is finalized. Ultimately, all of this work is about fighting to ensure New Yorkers can afford to live and thrive in this city, but it cannot be done alone. We do this work in the face of very real threats from the federal government. Your advocacy to secure a fully funded housing and urban development budget is critical. So far, we've been successful in obtaining much needed funding for HUD programs. But the President's recently released budget again proposes draconian, cruel cuts to HUD funding, including a 15% decrease in spending for critical, affordable, and public housing programs. We will continue to call on the fierce and steadfast advocacy of the City Council, our Congressional delegation, and so many partners here and across the country to fight back. I want to thank the Council for their partnership, and I look forward to continuing to find ways to partner on critical legislative priorities and needed reforms, on affordable housing and supportive projects, on advocacy for stronger protections for tenants, and on a whole host of issues vital for the good of New Yorkers and for, the, for our city. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss HPD's budget and our priorities in the coming year. This concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. It's always good to see you and your team. Um, I have a series of questions that are pretty in-depth but it's a testament to the fact that uh, a lot of what the city intends to do and its mission and vision hinges on the work that you do and that your agency does. So um, I'm going to begin just by delving into some of your testimony. Uh, so you mentioned in your testimony that this summer HPD is launching Housing Connect 2.0, which improves upon the current lottery system. Can you elaborate on the changes in the lottery system that, ap that applicants can expect to see? Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Uh, we're, we're really excited about um, this new system that's coming in the summer. Uh, our mission as um, an agency and as an administration is not only to build and preserve affordable housing, but to get that housing out to the folks who need it at a faster rate. And so we have spent um, a long time working on this system, which will um, be more efficient both for applicants and for the marketing agents. 
what will happen is the system, once you log in on the system and putting all your information, it will calculate the eligibility and um, for housing so that we're not sending a bunch of folks who are not eligible for the housing that we're putting out and having them go through a long log and having people come in and get disqualified. So we will qualify tenants through the system and only send qualified tenants to marketing agents in order to process them quickly. Um, it will allow a lot of the improvements that we're doing now, for example, in, in while we wait for this new system, so there'll be, people will be able to do e-signature, there'll be, documents will be able to go electronically so people don't have to go for, leave their jobs or take time off of their jobs to do repeat in visits in order to submit documents. Um, we're truly excited about this, we've been testing it so far, and um, we're looking forward to its launch in the summer. Thank you. Uh, how many applicants applied for housing through the lottery system in 2019, and how many applicants is that per available unit? So the overall number who applied, and <laughs> I guess the ratio of applicants to per unit. That is an excellent question, Council Member. I don't have those numbers um, at the ready, but we're happy to get back to you in your office on them. Yeah, that, that's kind of an important metric for us to, dis to, to understand because I think that um, I'm not the only council member who in their office probably gets uh, a, a, an inundated number of complaints about the lottery system. Um, and I will take into consideration that I represent Brooklyn yes. and Bed-Stuy, which probably has a higher number. I'm the, I'm the epicenter of gentrification right now. Yes. So I may have more than other members, but I've heard other members literally come to me and complain about it. So if you could get those numbers, it would be important for us to be able to understand um, uh, what's happening as we make these new improvements. I'm, I'm excited about the 2.0 as well, yes. but as I articulated to uh, uh, my constituents, um, I'd like to at least be able to use some of those numbers to articulate what we expect um, in change. Um, I'm just going to ask two more questions. I know my colleagues have to go and have been with me all morning, which is exciting. Thank you, uh, Margaret and Barry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with the Build It Back program. Uh, especially of single family homes. City funds of 7.4 million and community development brought grant disaster recovery funds totaling 10.6 million are added to fiscal 2020 to cover existing and projected expenses related to single family rebuilds under the Build It Back program. Can you provide additional details on HPD's involvement with this program? How much has been allocated to date to HPD to support single family rebuilds? Absolutely, thank you council member for that question. Um, so there are two aspects to this program. One is the single family um, home, home ownership uh, part of this program. So the seven million in city tax levy goes towards the uh, single family homes rehabilitation program. It is part of funds that were already um, earmarked as part of a 42 million addition to the entirety of the program. So this is just um, winding the winding down of the program. The 10.6 million is part of federal funds that were already earmarked as part of what I believe is a 50 million allocation to this part of the Building It Back program. The program is over 99% complete. Um, the city has assisted about 12,500 families across 8,300 homes. And um, we, these are funds to basically close out the program. On the multifamily side, um, oh, by the way, the eligibility for the single family program is done by the mayor's office, but we do a lot of the construction monitoring and um, monitoring of the scope and monitoring of the completion. On the multifamily side, also, um, this pro program is winding down to date, we've assisted 244 um, homes in this pipeline, and um, you know, 240 are complete and move-in ready, and about four are under construction, and three are nearly completion. So this is really, um, you know, money that's been earmarked 
already for the close of the program, but also I will turn to Rich Johns, um, our Associate Commissioner for Finance, to elaborate. The Build It Back program in total um, for HP. Oh, I'm sorry, just for the record, would you just identify yourself? Oh, yes. I, I know who you are, but just. Uh, Richard Johns, Associate Commissioner of Financial Management for HPD. Thank you. Um, the um, HPD's Build It Back programs to date have um, spent or have been allocated $655 million. Um, of that, $647 million is through the um, Community Development Disaster Block Grant program. And how much of it has been, how, how much more is there to be spent down or allocated out of that larger number? I, I heard the, the smaller number, the yeah. 655 million number. I, I, I'm sorry, the, the 647 um, uh, is just the federal portion of the program. So the amount left to be spent down right now is the 10 million, uh, 10.6 million that was allocated in the preliminary budget. Got it. So all I didn't have was the larger number. I had, I had the smaller numbers. Thank you. Um, how does HPD anticipate this work? I mean, sorry, when does ant uh, HPD anticipate that this work will all be wrapped up so everybody's done, uh, everybody's in their homes, by what date and time? So we expect that um, all of the work would be wrapped up uh, this year, 2020. So as I said, with the multifamily program, we have 240 um, homes that are complete, there are four under construction, and three which are nearing completion. And with a single family as well, we expect that all the program will be wrapped up this year, 2020. Okay, so both, both programs should be finalized this year. Before I continue, I wanted to ask, uh, Margaret, do you have any questions? Yes. yes. Margaret Chen. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. So as the Chair of the Committee on Aging, I'm going to start with uh, a question about the production and preservation of uh, senior housing. I know that in the, um, the Mayor's uh, Senior First Initiative, yes. um, they increased the, the number of units. So in the plan from January 2015 to December 2019, the city financed the preservation and creation of about 9,100 senior housing units, including constructions of 4,100 senior units and preservation of 5,000. Um, it just seems like there's a lot, fo lot more focus um, on preservation which is important, but we really need to continue to build more because the older adult right now represent one in five, about 20%. Uh, so how is the HPD gonna sort of commit to financing new affordable senior housing at a rate um, that reflects the increase uh, of the growth in the senior population and also in the the projected almost threefold growth in the homeless senior population? Yes. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So, um, our housing plan is multifaceted and um, it, it seeks to serve many vulnerable um, parts of our city, not um, seniors included. The city, um, this administration pledged uh, $500, $500 million um, for seniors and we pledged to issue RFPs to meet that goal. Uh, Office of Management and Budget has allocated the funds for us to produce that housing and um, I believe we've just issued two RFPs on NYCHA property to, um, for respondents to produce the senior housing that we, um, we agreed to do. In addition, we, we you know. So the 500 million is gonna be focused on building new units. Yes. And in, in addition, we are 60, preservation is 60% of the plan and we serve seniors in more than new construction. So we serve seniors not only in new construction projects that are geared towards seniors, but we serve seniors through our lottery as well. So as new units that are not targeted just for seniors are put online, we have many seniors applying through our lottery and they get housing that way. But in addition, because preservation is 60% of our plan, 
we are preserving housing for seniors in, um, in the communities where they live. And part of our preservation plan, when we do um, have a project, we do a survey of who's living in, in, the, uni in the units, and we offer many um, design changes within those units where seniors reside so that they can age in place. And so we're serving seniors not just in the, the new construction projects that are targeted specially for seniors, but also in preservation and also through our lottery. And part of the, with the senior housing, do you coordinate with the other agency? Because one of the issues that we have raised in past hearing is the providing the support services. I mean, just like similar models, supportive housing, yeah. uh, oftentimes, you know, a new senior building is built, but there's no services um, provided. No security, um, no social services, and then in the council, we have to go find, you know, additional fundings um, to do that. But I think that when we are creating senior housing, that we definitely need to make sure um, that the supportive services are included. So that's one thing. The other thing that when you mention about um, the other affordable units that's being built, that is true. I mean, we encourage senior to apply as if you fit the income requirement. And then right after that, we also encourage them to apply for the senior citizen rent increase exemption. Yes. Because what we have heard also uh, from seniors who are actually working and they were able to get into um, senior housing, now all of a sudden they're going to retire and their income is going to drop and they were told by management office, well, you got to pay the same rent. There's, you're not in NYCHA, your rent doesn't go down when your incomes go down. And the only thing that we can offer is apply for screen so that your rent won't go up. But that is going to be another issue um, for our seniors if their income, if they're retiring and their income drop they might not be able to continue to live in the affordable housing that they were so lucky um, to get into. So that is something that we really need to pay attention down the road when we're building um, these affordable units that we'll make sure that people can continue uh, to live in those. Absolutely. Um, so SCREE is an incredible tool uh, to protect seniors from rent increases that would make them rent burdened. Um, we play a very uh, minor role in administering SCREE. We administer SCREE for Michelamas and HDFCs, while DOF administers SCREE uh, city for the rest of the properties citywide. What we do at HPD is that we do continuous ongoing outreach within Michelama projects and within HDFC projects to register seniors for SCREE. And so that is an ongoing thing because, um, Council Member, we agree with you that we need to protect seniors from increasing rents and the inability to stay in their homes. Um, on the hearing with OMB, we've heard that um, they were able to identify a certain number of units. I think it was about 200 units of vacant apartments in f development that got 421A um, tax abatement. It seems like a very you know, small number, but um, that they can use that to um, bring in homeless family. Are HPD tracking other affordable housing apartment um, that HPD finance and and to see if like those apartments are filled and if there's any vacancy in there, um, how do we capture those apartments back? I, I really appreciate that question. Thank you, council member. So um, the unit, HPD uh, monitors its marketing very closely. Um, and we believe that no unit should stay vacant while we have an affordable housing crisis. So our marketing, the, department um, identified those units that were struggling um, to be filled and went to OMB with a proposal to fill them with um, 
homeless tenants who need housing. And um, we had to change our marketing guidelines in order to do that, but our goal is not only to get housing out to the market as quickly as possible, but when we identify a, an area where we can fill a need, um, that's what we did with those units. So we will continue to, mark, to monitor our marketing, and wherever there's an opportunity to repeat this, as we have done, we're going to do that. Are there any, are these development um, required to keep a waiting list? I mean, like people apply and then they, they didn't get in, but they want to know, well, do I have a chance to be on a waiting list? Are there waiting lists? No, they aren't wait lists. So our, our intent on initial marketing is that the units are filled. And if a property goes through our marketing process and a unit is not filled, we are um, dedicated to filling that unit with a homeless tenant. Um, and that process is very quick. We work closely with DHS in order to streamline the process, to screen the tenants. Um, we believe that with a crisis, um, speed uh, is of the essence. And so um, we've taken that path to fill the units. On re-rental, um, for example, when we have our new Housing Connect, Housing Connect 2.0, we will be re-renting all units that become vacant through that system. And so that's an opportunity for when, the, when a unit becomes vacant for the city to fill very quickly, which negates any need for a wait list. So what the Housing Connect 2.0 system will do if, if you're registered and um, what it will ask is your preferences, do you want, what borough you wanna live in, what size unit do you have, what is your household composition, how much you make, and if people keep that information updated, as soon as there's a re-rental, the system will pull everybody that is eligible based on their profile in Housing Connect and send them a notice that the unit is available and send their information to an owner so that we can quickly rent up the unit on re-rental. So um, with the new system coming on and uh, we, we, there's no need for a wait list, we will get people to these units as quickly as possible. Okay, so why don't, I mean, we still have so many people who are homeless, so why don't we just, if there is a vacancy, can HPD just, or the city take it back and, and place the homeless family in there? I mean, like what you're trying to do with the 421A. I mean, like instead of remarketing it again uh, to the general public, um, is that a possibility to continue to really focus on the, the greatest need, the people who are in the shelters? So I, I appreciate that, that, that question, council members. So we're doing, um, there's such enormous need across the city in so many different ways. And we're doing a lot right now to place, for example, we're excited about working with the council and getting the 15% home life set aside bill passed. And we've changed, our, we've changed our term sheets and the programs that we need to do to increase that set aside. We're also filling homeless um, units through our lottery. So people come in with vouchers for our lottery and they're able to get um, housing that way. We're also um, looking through our marketing and whenever something is not filled, for example, you know, we build these units in the community and we have preferences for the community, for disabled members of the community, for people who've reside in the community for a long time to be able to fill that housing. And um, we're also pivoted our housing plan so that we're serving the lowest income, people making 30% um, $30,000 a year for a family of three and $50,000 a year for a family of three. So we're really trying to balance so many things. We're not leaving the homeless behind, but we're also trying to make sure that the communities see um, the benefit of being able to stay in, in their community and afford homes in their community through our lottery. So we're doing everything we can. We're, we continue to think it through. We'll continue to work with you and get your ideas, but um, I'm proud of the marketing team for identifying those units and for making sure that we were able to offer them to DHS. Thank you. 
Just a couple more questions. On the, I know we've talked about like helping um, small property owners to protect, to preserve the affordable housing. We're trying to find some creative program because like in my district, for example, in Chinatown, Low East Side, we have small property owners or owners who are, you know, the building belong to the family association and we don't want them to sell the building, yes. but they're getting inundated with high property tax. And a lot of the program that the city have are like loan programs. Yes. And so we're looking at creatively to see how we can tie property tax to preserving affordable housing. We do that a lot with you know Article 11, with big buildings, and so we're looking at to see if we can create a model where we can encourage um, these small property owners that are providing affordable housing that they can work with the city to maintain those affordable units and in exchange either get a deduction on their property tax or get a deferral on their property tax. Means that you, can, you don't have to pay a certain amount, but if you sell your building or you turn units over, then you have to pay back uh, the city. Yes. So we're looking at some you know, creative ways of really helping these small property owners because they're getting inundated with calls every day. Oh, we want to buy your building, you know, and it's like they try to lowball them, you know, with, but they don't want to sell the building. It's, it's part of their family, it's, it's part of the community, but they're just getting hit with these property tax. Because if somebody next door fix up the building, your property tax goes up. And we're not offering, you know, any kind of really program from the city that can help them. I mean, a lot of them is like, even if it's low interest loan, you still have to pay the interest. So I think that's something that I would really want to work with um, you on, commission and your staff, to see if we can really do this to help a lot of the, the small property owners. And they're the one that every year go to protest the rent hike. Yes. Because they're the one that is really are suffering. You know, they, they are not making enough money. Meanwhile, the big building, they could afford it uh, because they have so many units. But the smaller building, uh, the smaller property owner, we really need to find some way um, to help them. And I think the property tax uh, is some, you know, it's an area we could definitely look at because we're grant. I mean, every month we're granting Article 11 yeah. to a lot of these, you know, buildings that, but they are much bigger buildings. Absolutely. So. Um, Thank you, Council Member. We look forward to working with you and with DOF on, on proposals. Um, I would like to say, though, thank you to the Council for supporting Home Fix, which is a program that I think might be helpful in that it's not just a loan. We give grants and 0% um, loans as well to property owners so that they could fix their properties and be able to collect higher rents. And so while this is not a property tax reform proposal, um, the council was very supportive of this program. And since we, in the first month of the launching, we got a thousand applications where we had on money for only 250. So this is a really great program that while it doesn't, it doesn't, um, take care of the tax issue, it does help people repair their buildings in order to get the rents um, that they can get on the buildings. And um, it, it depends on need, so the neediest people get the best terms. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to pay the loan back, we, it could be a grant. Thank you, that's good. Um, the, uh, the last question I have is that um, on the J51 program, um, that's another program that can possibly help <laughs> yes. um, building owners and small property owners to really fix their building. And I know that HPD is really looking at a way to reform this yes. because I know that they were, when they were converting a lot of buildings down here um, into residential building, yes. they took advantage of the J51 program. But ironically, there was no affordable housing that was created. Right? Yes. It's, it's all market rate housing. Yeah. Um, so what, what is HPD um, kind of looking at how to reform um, 
the J51 program, and also on the enforcement side too, how to enforce building that actually took advantage and make sure that they comply you know, with the law. I mean, we have so many cases, and you've heard about in the media, people are, they were taken advantage of, now they're suing to get their money, and there was all these like 421G program, which <laughs> yes, a lot of us were not really familiar with it. Uh, Still around. <laughs> yeah. But definitely the J51 is something that helped fix up buildings or conversions and Thank you, Council Member. Um, as, as you may know, tax incentives um, enforcement is dear to my heart, as well as um, making tax incentives um, work to create affordable housing. Um, to that end, our team at HPD have worked to look at J51 and make sure that it is a tool that supports naturally occurring affordable housing to make sure that um, people who are providing housing to low-income New Yorkers get the relief they need in order not only to upgrade systems but to upgrade them in an energy efficient way. Um, we are close um, to the end of our analysis. We're talking with OMB and we hope to be able to share something soon. That would be good because we have buildings in my district that I'm really trying to work on uh, with your staff. It's you know getting conversion from you know commercial into residential because yes. people are already living there, right? Yes. And we just got to make sure that we can legalize those buildings, make it safe, make it continue to be affordable. Anything that could create other opportunities and um, you know creating affordable units and looking at how we can bring back some you know safe yes. um our sro you know micro units and when you talk about in your testimony you know building module housing yes we just got to find creative way of creating as many units as possible in Absolutely. the quickest amount of time because um <laughs> that's what is needed out there so i look forward to really you know working with you and, and your great staff on this thank you thank you council member thank you thank you chair Thank you, Councilmember Chen. Uh, Councilmember Bredenter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would say good morning, Commissioner, but we're well beyond that. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. I, I do want to uh, echo, I'm, I'm glad she brought it up, my, my colleague to my left, uh, Margaret Chin, about the J51 program. It's extremely important in my community also. Um, I, I know we work hand in glove with um, our local elected officials uh, from Albany. Um, uh, to try to rise up the value that they're allowed to um, to use these exemptions for it's uh, it's extremely important for my um, my uh, affordable co-ops I have oh probably 15 to 20 thousand units that um, mostly garden apartments uh, some some high-rise but uh, mostly garden apartments that depend on those tax breaks they make a difference and um, they, uh, you know, affordable in your district and affordable, it, it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, we don't have any subway, so it's, it's all, all part of the mix. My district is not all upper income. I understand that. No, and, <laughs> and neither is mine. I do too. Um, no, I'm saying that, uh, you know, we, what we expect in Manhattan, what we expect in Eastern Queens might be different things, but they're really not. Um, I just want to ask you quickly um, about the modular housing that you mentioned on page three. Um, and I just, um, are we doing the modular work in New York City? I just don't want to be exporting construction jobs to another part of the country and then have watching it come in over the George Washington Bridge uh, at night on an oversized vehicle. Um, you know, I represent, I grew up uh, across the street from Electchester, which is the headquarters of Local 3, uh, which represents the uh, most of the unionized electricians in New York City, and um, we obviously have a very good relationship with them and, and uh, the other construction trades. So could you talk a little bit about that and how that's working? Absolutely. So um, we, it, it took a while, but we finally closed on our first module project in December. Um, and, you know, it was important for us to do that because the company that is doing the modular work is in the Navy Yards. And so um, we, you know, 
they depended on this deal in order to keep going and we felt it was important to support that industry here in the city and to support that industry in the Navy Where's it located? Just curious. In the Brooklyn Navy Yards? Okay, okay, that's great. I know I, I know we've done some of that work over the years, and I, I remember I was uh, at the Brooklyn Library a number of years ago. There was a big building that was done modular there. I can't, right off Grand Army Plaza, or right on Grand Army Plaza. So, okay, I'm glad to hear that's local. Um, the other question I have, uh, on the basement conversions, um, that would require zoning changes to make them legal? Is that yes. my, that's my understanding. That's okay. All right. That's, I just wanted that reassurance and not as popular in my district as they might be in other parts of New York City. And, you know, we're still struggling um, with school overcrowding, um, no mass transit to speak of except for buses. Um, we're trying to change that with the Long Island Railroad, but it may take a while before we get to that point. So that's all I have for you. I want to thank you for your work. It's always good to see you, Commissioner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, so um, on the modular, I do want to cite that um, uh, many members of the trades are asserting that they're being excluded in the modular construction industry or, or being limited in their participation. So while, yes, some of it's produced locally uh, and in, in the Great Borough of Brooklyn, uh, some of the trades, uh, including plumbing and electrical, are citing um, uh, this kind of uh, way of getting around their participation in Modula for, so I want to flag that for you because we are um, a, a labor-driven city and it has provided a pathway to uh, yes. uh, the middle class for many people, especially people of color. Um, and I don't want it to be inadvertent that they're excluded, uh, but I, I would just cite for you that I've heard on many occasions the trades have complained um, about their, their being excluded in the modular, although it's being produced here. So please look into that. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so the, it, it took, what, almost an hour and a half for me to get to home ownership, uh, <laughs> but here we are. Uh, the Housing New York plan not only benefits tenants, there are also home ownership component to the plan. As of December 2019, HPD reports that over 25,000 homes have been financed to support and sustain affordable home ownership citywide. What are the major programs contributing to these homeowner stats? So I know that there are programs that, that lead directly to home ownership. Um, some I'm familiar with, but for the record, would you cite, cite those programs? Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, we, our housing plan um, tries to meet the needs of New Yorkers throughout the city, and we recognize the need for home ownership. We recognize the need for um, people to be able to build equity that they can use um, for wealth building. And so, you know, some of the programs that um, contribute to these numbers, for example, the Mitchell-Lama program, we have um, to date, um, we have 21,602 homeownership units that we have, um, have financed under Housing New York and um, preserved about um, total 40,000 as a combination of rental and co-ops, but the, the homeownership portion of the Mitchell-Lama pre um, preservation is 21,602 units. We also have the green housing preservation. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, just so I'm sure, just so I'm clear, my stats say that you've done 25,000 units. You're saying 21,000 of those units are Michelama? Um, and the housing in New York, we've preserved 21,602 units. And, the and, and those are pri primarily preservation, not new construction or not new. That's correct. So, so the 4,000 or so that are outstanding from the Michelama preservation package are, are comprised of what? So we have a combination of our green housing preservation program, once again, where we have helped homeowners make repairs in order to reduce utility costs and in order to keep their homes. We have also launched Home Fix, as I mentioned earlier, which is another effort to help homeowners who have trouble keeping their homes and keeping up with repairs, that we are giving them grants 
or um, very low interest loans in order to fix their roofs and their boilers and to rehab an additional unit that they can rent so that they can maintain the cost of their unit. We also have an open door program, which is our new construction um, homeownership program geared towards low moderate and, and low moderate and middle income homeowners. And we closed on our first project, Sydney House, with about 50, 57 units in February 2018. And, and it's currently under production, but we have a steady pipeline of projects slated for open door. Um, I'd like to add that 60% of our homeownership opportunities that we've done so far have been for the extremely low or very low income New Yorkers. So this is really making sure that people were losing, ho uh, people are not losing homeownership opportunities um, within the city that we already have, because we know people are struggling to keep their homes. Through ANCP, which is, um, we have converted 27 buildings for 358 apartments from rental to homeownership. Are they are they co-op or Michelama or They're, they're co-op, so ANCP is a co-op program transferring rental units into home ownership units for the existing tenants. So can you, do you have an overall number of not new construction, but new uh, opportunities for home ownership through the existing programs? So, so far we have created through Housing New York or preserved as a combination, 25,870. Right. So I have that number. I, I just, I just want to know what the difference between A, preservation, and new, and new is. And construction. Only so that I could perhaps find a way that through the council's help, we could get to a, 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 higher, a higher number. While preservation is incredibly important, I don't want to have people think that I don't know that the basis for some of this is obviously preservation. Um, but in the climate that we find ourselves, it's also important to begin to create new pathways. And I say that because we have a lot of uh, young people, and I, you know, I, I don't know whether they're millennials, Gen X, I, I don't know where they are, but th we have young folks who are now, who have been tasked to go away and get great education and come home and find the only opportunities for them is through deep affordability, which they outrank the, their first year out of school and there are no pathways to home ownership for, for them. So we're asking our students to, you know, our young people to be high performing and they're doing that and then finding their city un unaffordable to them. So there's, there's various degrees. I know there are a thousand people who could come and say that it's affordable. Um, uh, we've, had, we've, had, we've heard from my colleague who chairs aging, um, the aging committee and, and certainly the city's unaffordable to them. But I think it's incredibly crazy that even the young people who, ha who are getting fairly decent jobs find the city unaffordable to them. I don't know where we're going to find ourselves. So these no, no, no pathways to new home ownership opportunities concerns me greatly. Okay. So, uh, so if you could just get that number for me, it, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you, council members. So we have created 1,000. 118 um, new home ownership units as part of this plan and we continue with our new open door program we are going to step that up to produce more units um, you know we part of preserving our home ownership um, is to help the seniors who are feeling that they are now unable to keep the homes that they have and homes that they intend to pass on to their children. But I think we're a city that can walk and chew gum at the same time so we can protect our seniors through preservation while also creating pathways for our young people f to have home ownership opportunities. And I'm, I just want to continue to say that because I think it's important. I think you guys are working towards it, but let me help you. I don't know whether it's in the languaging or whether it's in the marketing. Let me be of some assistance. And it's incredibly personal for me who has uh, six high-performing children who I don't want to come home and stay with me <laughs> when, when, when they're done. I'd like for them to have an opportunity and pathway for, their, for themselves. So, and I know that there are many people in the city who, who find themselves in the same, in the same position. So um, we, yes. So uh, we, we work so well with the council, and so we look forward to working with you and your members. Um, we, although we are creative, we don't know everything, so we look forward to working jointly with you. 
What is the average income of, of homeowners assisted through your programs, and what percentage are minorities or senior head of households? So three different demographics, which you've mentioned in your testimony and you've just mentioned now, what is the percentage of those? So as, as I previously said, 60% of our homeownership opportunities are for the very low income, making about $30,000 or less um, for a family of three, or um, low income, uh, extremely, extremely low income, sorry, making $30,000 or less for a family of three, or very low income, $50,000 or less. Um, we are also providing homeownership opportunities through Open Door for moderate and middle income. Like I said, this is a new program, so we've closed on 57 units and we're going to continue to ramp up. We have, um, I can, we can give, I, I don't think we have a breakdown um, by ethnicity, but our office can follow up with. Um, I, I, I would certainly like to get that because I think that the city, while it's being gentrified through the roof, mm -hmm. has a responsibility where it can, the city, where mm -hmm. it can, to be a tool and a pathway to those people who are being priced out of areas. We have a responsibility to do that. And without knowing what the number is or, you know, of, of ethnicities affected by the programs that are, that are there, then we can't target when necessary. So I, I'd definitely like to see what those numbers are as it relates to ethnicity. Um, we've been joined by uh, my colleague Helen Rosenthal. Um, I have two more questions, and then I will. Uh, I just want to stay on this home ownership uh, and finish my questions there, and then we'll have Helen. Um, does how many programs provide down payment assistance, and what's the average loan amount awarded through HPD's Home First Down Payment Assistance Program? Thank you, Council Member, for that um, question. We are incredibly proud of the fact that we have increased our uh, contribution to down payment assistance from about $20,000 to $40,000. Um, this down payment assistance is available for all of our home ownership programs, and so any first time home buyer can apply to the agency for that assistance. Um, so I would ask in terms of outreach um, to, to people to have them understand that this program exists for them, especially the down payment program. What, what is the methodology used uh, for outreach? And before you answer that, how can, my, how can my office and this committee be helpful in getting that information out? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So when we create um, a home ownership project, uh, typically through our marketing and through the sponsor, every um, potential applicant is made aware not only of our training, um, because we want first-time home buyers to understand what it means to own a home and what the responsibilities are, but they're also um, told about our down payment assistance. Uh, so, so I think that there are people in my community in particular who are not aware that these programs exist. So I'd certainly like to partner with your office. Absolutely to make sure whether it's through joint literature or whether it's through robocalls or whether whatever it is, that we can get more people aware of the programs that exist uh, as it relates to pathways to home ownership, in particular, uh, the down payment assistance. Thank you, council member. Um, we are excited about partnering with you on future home ownership projects and with your other council members, we'll be happy for our planning team to come out through various council districts to explain um, what we have to offer homeowners. As you know, we're both on a working group where we're discussing a lot of new ideas for how HPD can be more proactive mm -hmm. and more supportive to homeowners. And so I look forward to working with you to get those ideas to be a reality. Uh, just for the record, I do appreciate um, our co-collaboration within that task force. I think it's going to yield uh, some things that the city has never seen before. So I, I thank you for your efforts there. Um, I am a little concerned about the fact that the administration had put forward at first um, uh, a number of 200,000, which went to 300,000 targeted for affordable housing units. Mm -hmm. And there was never a target number articulated for home ownership. So there was a very aggressive marketing plan and target around 300,000 units of affordable housing. 
um, it puts me in a very precarious position because I don't want to, in my district, be responsible for only pushing deep affordability and not pushing um, the ability for home ownership. But there was never a number that I could articulate. Whenever the number around affordable housing units was mentioned, there was always this 300,000 unit number. And, and people worked towards that goal. Um, there's no number, to my knowledge, that represents the number of targeted units for, afford for um, home ownership. Is there a particular reason that was? Did I miss the number? Um, can we come to a number? I think it's important, though, because that number came and then people worked diligently towards that number. The agencies, uh, the council, everybody seemed to be ta focused on this target yes. number, uh, which we call a big, hairy, audacious goal. So there was this BHAG for affordable housing units, but never one for pathways to home ownership. Um, I think they should, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. I don't know why we can't have a target number unless you can tell me why there's no target number. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So, to date, uh, of the nearly 150,000 homes that we've produced as part of um, Housing New York, 17% home ownership represents 17%. Um, with your home, NYC, which the mayor announced as part of the state of the city, the mayor has pledged that we will uh, make sure that we put enough city-owned land um, out into RFP to support a further 3,000 shared equity models for home ownership. So we're excited to work on um, the, C the new CLT program, which will produce shared equity home ownership opportunities throughout the city. In addition, our we, we hear you and we hear the advocates, and this administration is really focused on home ownership. And so we pledge that through our Open Door program and through ANCP and through NIHOP, which is our a new construction infill program that we're going to be pushing in the future to exceed our production. Uh, the only problem with that is one, uh, that's too many characters to hashtag, and <laughs> and and two, without an actual number, we don't know whether we're winning or losing. With that three hundred thousand unit number, we know if we don't get there, we lost. Without with this was with you know, and I don't mean to be disrespectful with with the vagueness of the home ownership piece, it's hard to articulate a win in that. We, and we can always say, hey, we did so much. And, 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 I, and I respect and appreciate the fact that there has been a commitment demonstrated by HPD and the administration to home ownership. This wasn't something that was talked about very much prior to now. So I respect and appreciate it. It's just that we don't have any number to fixate on um, that we can say we're working towards and that we can demonstrate if we fall short of that, that, that there was not a success. So I definitely would like to work with you going forward and the administration to get to a number that I can A, hashtag, and that two, we can actually determine whether or not we're being successful or, or not based on working towards a number. Um, I will leave it there and, and have uh, Helen Rosenthal from the great borough of Manhattan Thank you so much, Chair Carnegie. Thank you for your leadership on all of these issues. Commissioner, I haven't had a chance to meet you, and I would love to sit down so t sometime. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I look <laughs> forward to sitting down with you. I wanted to follow up on two um, vexing issues in my district, and I'm wondering if uh, um, you need any additional, HPD needs additional staff on these issues. One is that um, um, there, in, in, on the Upper West Side, there are affordable housing buildings that need where there are uh, that where there are units that need preservation um, that have not been closely watched, and um, so let me give you a couple examples. One is um, a building on um, 315 West 61st Street where um, uh, there was a requirement in the land use deal that the developer build, have a building just for low income seniors. And over time, uh, the management of that building has changed hands 
and it's unclear whether or not the tenants are, are being served well. Similarly, a very recent example of that at 100 Freedom Place South, where um, a brand new building built with, you know, what, with uh, two separate entrances, and the entrance for the uh, affordable housing folks um, is, is already falling apart. And this building was built two years ago, maybe, and the front door already can just be jerked open. There's no concierge, no place to put the packages, blah, blah, blah. And I'm wondering if HPD could engage with our office to help those tenants in terms of their management company. But it raises both of these issues, one very long term and this one more recently, ra raise the specter for me in my district, but then applicable to the rest of the city, are we really, what's, what's the oversight on these management companies in terms of um, taking care of the tenants and keeping the tenants safe in their homes? Let me give you one more example that's a little bit different. On Riverside Boulevard, um, all those old Trump buildings, mm -hmm. um, it's like Baltimore, you can't even say his name, but, um, <sighs> They, there are, um, you know, they are old 80-20 buildings. Yes. So I've never been able to really wrap my head around working with your staff. Like, why doesn't the city know which of the tenants were the affordable housing tenants? And how can we protect them to stay in their homes? Because for some of them, the, for some of the buildings, the rule seems to be after 20 years, it reverts to market no matter what. For some of them, the rule seems to be it reverts to market but only when the tenant leaves. And for some, it seems to be it'll never, the abatement's gone, but it'll never revert to market. Okay. And of course, the building owners and management are saying get out to all three of those separate buildings. And I've never been able to, I'm, I've been trying to organize in some of those buildings, organize the tenants, but because the deals were made in the mid 90s, I haven't been able, we haven't been able to identify exactly which apartments. I would love to send a letter, HPD, our office, send a letter to those tenants exactly and say, you have the right to stay in your home. So, Council and I understand the complexity because blah, 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 but how do we get over that complexity? Council Member, I'm glad you asked that question. This is a recurring issue that we felt we've dealt with over the years, so um, we know which tenants are. So these 8020s have a few benefit programs layered onto one onto the other. So an 8020 will typically have 421A, where when the benefit expires after the existing tenant leaves, um, based on you know some factors, a unit can become a market rate unit. However, these 8020s typically also have voluntary inclusionary housing program layered onto it, which means that in fact the units can never be destabilized because inclusionary housing is is requires permanent affordability. Um, HPD in 2016 created a compliance and enforcement unit for tax incentives to combat just this and many other issues that are coming up on these 8020s. So um, we have the resource. We'd like to work with your, um, your office to make sure that we're sending the letters out to um, these owners saying that one, you need to retract any um, misinformation that you've given to your tenants, and if they're in fact um, trying to destabilize units that are required to be permanently affordable, um, we will we will go after them. So we have um, revoked incentives for folks. We have brought um, since 2016 about 60,000 units back into rent stabilization mm. through our enforcement efforts, and so we would be happy to work with your office to clean clean this up. 
Do you have some sort of monster spreadsheet where you identify each building and what the different regulatory rules are for those buildings? And could you, I mean, I think it's silly for you to just send it to me, but if you could send it out to people, because we would be interested in being helpful there, number one, and number two, in the buildings themselves, where it's an 8020, J51, 420, whatever, do you know the apartment numbers? Could you get us that level of detail? So we, we know the apartment numbers. We know what benefits buildings are receiving. Um, you know, what I would say is, if you give us an address of a property, we'll be able to give you that information. Yeah, I mean, I've done an analysis in my district, so I know, I think I know the buildings, but I'm wondering if you can send me for my district, knowing all the addresses that exist in my district, which is basically Community Board 7, so it's the same overlay. If you sort it by Community Board, that'll work fine for me. So this is an excellent question. This is a moment for, we can send you, for example, the inclusionary properties, but it's a moment for us to give a plug for our inclusionary housing map. Every property that ever receives um, inclusionary housing is immediately mapped onto our map. It shows who's receiving the benefits, who's generating um, inclusionary benefits and for what private properties they're generating benefits and it's very easy to download a report of every property in your community district in your council district that's receiving either voluntary inclusionary housing benefits and for areas that are mapped for MIH that are also receiving those benefits if a property is mapped it means that the units that are identified are permanently affordable, but our, our people can work with your staff yeah, yeah. and give you a report. I mean, that's tremendous that you have that. So, you know, I'm always thinking about, I'm sorry, I, I won't just meander, but I mean, <laughs> how can your office make it easy Absolutely. for those who can get the word out? Right. Absolutely. I mean, what would make it easy for my office <laughs> is if you could say, Council Member District 6, um, please send letters to this address, send a letter saying such and such, and here are the apartment numbers, address it to the apartment numbers. To these set of addresses, you're going to have to send a little bit of a different letter, here are the apartment numbers, here's a one pager you can send them. To these set of buildings, it's a little different. Because the more you make my completely under-resourced office do that, we're just not going to. And if I were to send a letter to every building, every address, and say, you figure out which building, type of building you're in and what the rules are, they're not going to do it either. So is there some way for HPD, which is more resourced than my office, to make it easy for my office and any council member's office to do something like that? And if the answer is no, can the council urge the mayor to give you more resources because you have access directly to this information. Council member, the answer is yes. We can work with your office to get you the information you need. Yeah, but you know, in this chair at this moment, I represent the city. I'm asking on behalf of my colleagues too. Absolutely. So when we formed the Compliance um, and Enforcement Unit for Tax Incentives, we did it um, for just that reason. And okay. so um, we're happy to work with your office. We're, we're open for business for every day, um, going after property owners and making sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do um, in, in return for the tax incentives. So we're happy to work with your office and other council offices to get that word out. Fantastic, thank you. How long would that take? Like, could I? expect to get a package like that in a week, a month, a couple months? We'll, we'll work with your office. We'll, we'll, let's talk offline and um, we'll do the research as to how many units and how many properties and we'll make sure you have what you need. Okay. I mean, again, I think my takeaway would be if the answer ends up being longer than two months, then I would ask the committee staff to ask for additional staff 
for this unit. I mean, that seems sort of reasonable. Um, and then the last question, I'm worried about people, as we call it in the gig economy or freelancers, whatever, and Housing Connect. Um, I've had a number of my constituents who have that fluctuating income and have been um, um, rejected. You know, they were given an opportunity, they, they won a lottery, they, they got to apply, but then their income is so variable. How do we, how does HPD, have you, have you made any progress on that? This is something we've talked about for a couple of years. I, I wonder, at one point I thought progress was being made, but I don't know what the status is now, sort of how you manage that. Thank you, council member, for that question. Um, I would like us to sit with your office um, and talk offline as to how we can work to make sure that income qualifications um, reflect more of, an, of your annual income. And um, we can talk about the specifics of the instances that you're seeing. Well, I mean, again, I, I've brought this up at prior meetings, so, um, Actually, I mean, what would be so great is if you all could think about a policy where for people in the gig economy, maybe you look at a three-year or five-year window on income and not a one-year window. I don't know if you're constrained by federal law or state law on that, but this is a real issue that currently prohibits people in the gig economy from having access to New York City affordable housing. So uh, thank you, Council Member. I'm glad you raised um, the, the federal law issues. So we do a lot of tax credit projects and um, in our new construction pipeline. And these are federal laws that are very strict about how we income qualify tenants. So I would love an opportunity oh, so to talk with you offline. Yes. And is there some way, just this last question I promised council member, that the city could subsidize to get over those hurdles? Like somehow say, um, you know, it's the federal requirement, the person has to make this amount of money every year, so we're gonna guarantee that for people in the gig economy, they're gonna be able to reach that amount. And you can imagine some sort of complex, ridiculous algorithm where some years when they're making more, they could pay back the city, but the years they're making less, the city compensates. There are just so many people in this situation. Thank you, council member. We um, are always striving to serve um, all of the needy um, folks who need quality affordable housing. Um, this, we're always willing to sit with our budget folks and work with the council to find creative solutions. So, um, you know, what I would say is um, we, we should talk offline. All right, I mean, I'm probably not gonna pursue this, but this is something that I would imagine for you all, that would be a policy you might be willing and interested in costing out um, you know, I'm not sure it's my responsibility to figure this out, but it's an idea that's out there. I'd be really interested to hear back from HPD about whether or not that's something that's feasible. Thank you, Council Member. We will be sure to talk about it. <laughs> you are a sweetheart. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rivera. Thank you for. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I saw in your testimony very briefly that you mentioned CLTs and gaining up to 3,000 units of community-owned affordable housing, and I was very pleased to hear it in the state of the city. So I, I would like some, a few details. He's, the mayor spoke about opportunities for community land trusts, and in the five-year capital plan, there is $500,000 allocated for East Harlem El Barrio CLT, to rehabilitate three buildings and of course the other startup costs that'll be included. So that's a great start. I'm excited to see um, as the capital needs remain probably one of the biggest issues for CLTs. Is there any new funding for CLTs in the expense budget and does HPD plan to primarily support CLTs with capital funds or are they providing other programmatic support? Thank you, council member, for that question. Um, as you know, the, uh, the ability to create 
shared equity models in order to preserve uh, home ownership, especially um, opportunities in the future is something that the the administration and our agency has been working on for some time. Too often we create homeownership opportunities that are lost eventually because there isn't that ability to make sure that um, the, in, the gains and the increases in the value of that property gets um, recycled in a way that maintains homeownership long term. And so to that end, um, we had worked to create new CLTs so that they would, we would have capacity in order to build um, that, that, that area. And so we helped to form three CLTs so far, and we're supporting nine others. And we have a bunch of projects in the pipeline with Cooper Square, Interboro, East Harlem, El, El Barrio, Riseboro, UHAB, and others that we expect to close in calendar year 2020. So what we're trying to do is build the capacity, put together the development models that would make this something that is um, that we can recreate very easily. And so right now we're grappling with ground leases and um, you know ownership issues between the the, the not for profit fee owner of the of the ground lease versus the owner of the unit um, and how you know flip taxes and shared profits of resales happen between the not-for-profit that owns the fee ground lease versus the homeowner and so you know with that in mind we're we're still working out our RFPs that the mayor promised that we're going to use city-owned land to put these RFPs out so that um, not-for-profits can respond as to how we can continue to make this model something that is easily replicable so that we can ramp up to this 300,000, um, 3,000, sorry, um, units. And with that in mind, we're also working with our um, Office of Management and, and Budget to figure out what the true cost and capital needs are. So we're working through these these CLT closings in calendar year 2020, and that will inform a lot of what we continue to do. You said there were three of them? Um, yes, so there's Cooper Square, of course, there's um, Interboro CLT that, um, and we have uh, Riseboro, you have CLT as well, and we're working on a, a few others, um, a nine others that we're supporting to to, well, to well, I'm into. glad, you know, we are, we have been working on CLTs for years now, and uh, <laughs> Council Member Margaret Chin was instrumental in um, expanding the CLT list to include Cooper Square, among many, many others, and, and um, East Harlem El Barrio. So I'm just looking at whether, you know, you mentioned looking at a model. There are models that exist, clearly. We don't have the capital funds to invest in all of these CLTs, so it sounds like you're you're kind of traveling on the same path as we are. I just hope that we're doing it in tandem because we were very very pleased to hear the announcement at the State of the City, knowing we just negotiated over eight hundred thousand dollars in programmatic funds to the CLT organizers. So. I think great minds think alike. I just want to make sure that we're doing this together. And so I, I asked, does HPD plan for a community development fund that CLTs will have access to for ongoing maintenance or emergency repairs needs, considering that you mentioned the capital piece being such a big part of your campaign? So how we're looking at CLTs is, is to make them work like um, other developments where they're self-sustaining. And so part of the, the complexity of putting together these developments is to see how much in reserves the CLT can collect versus how much the homeowner pays when there is appreciation of the, the unit and then the homeowner is able to realize um, that appreciation in a resale, how much of it goes back to the CLT so it's self-sustaining. So that's what I mean by we're putting together all of these deals that we're closing in 2020 
and from all of the development work to put those together, we'll be able to replicate so that CLTs, we hope, will be self-sustaining, in a self-sustaining model within itself. I understand. I just wanted to see if, if you had numbers and, and, and plans considering we're discussing the budget. And my last question, Mr. Chair, is we hear from community members in HDFCs and till buildings about slow processing times for things such as loan processing, regulatory agreements, and reincorporations. So what, what is the holdup on, on the routine processes and are more resources needed? Thank you, council member, for that question. Um, our agency and our staff have done an incredible job um, over the, in concert with the council um, over the past couple of years with the till properties. Um, we now have only about 98 tills left. Um, that represents about 1,640 homes. 52% um, of that have been assigned a developer, so they're in pre-development, working towards closing and transfer to home ownership. And 48% um, are awaiting the assignment of a developer, but we expect all of them to be assigned, all of that 48% to be assigned within this fiscal year and working towards a closing date in our pipeline. So it's not a resource issue. We just want to make sure that we can process some of these regulatory agreements a, a lot quicker than they've been happening. So I'm, I'm trying to be helpful. You know, we're here to discuss what resources that you need that we can help you with. But thank you for the information, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. I, I do appreciate it. And thank you for being here, Commissioner, thank you. and everyone. Thank you so much. So we are now officially on our second round of questions, starting <laughs> with Margaret Chen. Thank you, Chair. I, I was looking at your testimonies. That you're, you were saying that in here, on page two, that the, your budget, $132 million comes from city funds, right? Yes. I know that Battery Park City is also in my district. And the surplus revenue that are generated uh, from that is supposed to go back into affordable housing. So is HBD getting any of that money? It better not just go to the general fund. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Yes. Um, so Battery Park City funding has been allocated as part of the housing plan. It is, uh, it comes through HDC into our projects as part of the funding, HPD reserve funding and HPD loan funding. And so um, I, I would turn to um, Rich Johns, our associate commissioner for finance to elaborate a little bit more about how we use BPCA money. Yeah, if you can, um share with us like the amount that you you got you know within the last couple of years because i think it's like i'm not sure if you get the total amount or you only get part of the amount when you so so the full amount for bpca currently goes to hdc um and we'll i, I actually don't have the information with me on how much hdc um has received to date um i can tell you that in the most recent allocation of um for 21a which is the BPCA funding, um, both HPD and HDC received a uh, $200 million allocation each. Um, so we can, we can follow up on the um, remaining amount, but the, the current BPCA funding that goes into HDC, it, it goes into our affordable housing projects. Um, and we, along with the Office of Management and Budget and HDC coordinate closely on how that funding is allocated and how it's spent. But what's the, um, so what is the total amount that they, that they generate, I mean, that so-called extra that they send over? Do we have that number? Um, okay. Thank you, council member. We don't, we don't have that number. It fluctuates. Um, we're actually currently, a lot of the BC, BPCA money comes from ground leases, and a lot of those ground leases are up for step-ups pretty soon, and there are negotiations right now. So basically, the money fluctuates based on the ground lease payments that are due from the developer. What I can say is that uh, BPCA money is certainly 
valuable to us in producing our housing. And it comes into play in areas where um, we need funds that that don't have as many restrictions, mm -hmm. whether um, on whether it can be it's expense money or capital money, and so when we have tricky um, situations where we absolutely need emergency funding to do a project, but the, the but capital funds can't be used for it, and we don't we can't use expense money. The BPCA money comes in um, to play in a very valuable way. That's good. I mean, but I think it's like we still want to know, I mean, just in terms of the amount. Because right now what's going on um, in Battery Park City, too, is also preserving middle-income housing. And um, negotiation is going on, and the deadline is end of June. Yes. And uh, we have people who help build up, you know, Battery Park City tenants who are living, well, this is particularly Gateway. Yes. Um, tenants who help build up. The city got schools, got library, yeah. and now they are in limbo. Yeah. And they just need the protection. I mean, they're still paying pretty much high rent, yes. but they need protection so that they can get lease renewal, they don't get huge rent increase. Um, and so we, we are you know, working with Battery Park City Authority, and I want to make sure that HPD is also involved in making sure that we can preserve um, middle-income housing there Absolutely. that we don't lose that opportunity. And the developer, I mean, he's not paying a lot of ground lease. So yes. if there's a way to work out uh, that we could get this protection, because as you said, the revenue is going to, more will come in because they're paying really low ground lease in the beginning. And we really have to seize this opportunity yeah. um, to preserve uh, the middle-income housing that we have in the city. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Absolutely. We have been talking with the state, um, with Ruth Ann, who's the head of HCR, and our staff has been doing a lot of um, tax analysis to try to figure out what is a good path forward. So we look forward to working with you as well. Yeah, and then we are, we are looking at really expanding it to include all the residents, not just the one, you know, the portion, because that's going to keep on shrinking. Uh, so we want to make sure the whole complex yeah. is preserved, and that will help, you know, other development in, in Battery Park City. We want to make sure that middle income is there. I mean, even though we didn't get low income or the moderate income, but the 20 percent, uh, I think we've been working with your office, too, is like identifying some of the building because we were hearing from seniors, from residents, that like all of a sudden they're getting a notice, like 20 years up, you gotta move. And people are so worried. And so we wanted to make sure that people know that they have you know, continued protection or how we can help them stay in the neighborhood that they helped to build. So that's something that I look forward to continue working with you on. Thank you, Council Member. Right. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, sorry, second round. Um, Two things. Have you, someone just approached me about a set of buildings in Brooklyn, the Decatur buildings. Are you familiar with these? 1355 is yes, one of the council addresses. Member. Yes, council member. So apparently the, the, own, the new owners have um, been caught um, in some corruption cases, maybe at other sites. And the people who are living at the unfinished site, but at, at those Decatur buildings, don't have leases. Um, and yet, the owner is taking advantage of the 421A tax abatement. Do you all follow up on stuff like that? Yes. Thank you, Council Member, for this question. We, our code enforcement folks, our tax incentive folks, our law department folks have been involved in this building for years. We have been in litigation. I am not certain if the litigation is over. Um, and we have worked really closely with DHCR. So we have um, resolved many issues concerning rents, tenant leases, um, the, the 
ability to have heat in the hallways, code, code enforcement violations, we can sit with your office and let no, you know our with history all due respect, in this building. Commissioner, that's exactly the opposite yeah. of what the tenants are saying. I, I appreciate that that's what the tenants are saying, but um, we have had a long history of working. I mean, this is from since Commissioner Vicki Bean was commissioner of this right. agency. I mean, that We've tells been working me, on if, it. If you've been working on this for a long time, and I'm, we're hearing from tenants that the problem still is going on today, there's clearly some sort of thing that's not working. Do you know what I mean? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't, you want to try some sort of different tact if people still don't have leases, heat, or hot water. Like, it sounds to me like, you know, I mean, do you have, or again, maybe it's an issue of resources. Do you have tenant organizers that you send in? Do you, what do you do to, if it's not working, right? I hear we've been working on it for years. The, the city but has, that raises red flags, right? The, the, city has, the city has resolved the issues in this building that concern us. So, yeah, we, we really can't, um, the public can't speak up at this. You'll have an opportunity. But, uh, look, I'm not going to go back and forth with you, but there's clearly a disconnect. And, and for me, that raises a red flag. And given that we're at a budget hearing, I mean, I would ask, I would infer from that that there's an issue with resources um, and that, you know, maybe the tenants could really benefit from some organizers or, you know, I know the litigation department needs more uh, employees. You know, I would really, I, it's this is an opportunity for the public to say and for you to say quite honestly regardless of folks from City Hall sitting here and folks from OMB sitting here for you to say honestly what's going on in your department and whether or not we're able to serve New Yorkers I mean I gotta say from the exchange that you just had with my colleague about Battery Park City mm -hmm. she gave the exact same example that I gave you know, with buildings and tenants being threatened. Um, and it's so, so obviously, it's not just happening in my district, it's not just happening in hers. And for your answer to be that, well, in 2016, we came up with these great regulations and sold them to the building owners, I mean, clearly the building owners are not following through. So is that, is this a complaint-driven system where we, the tenants have to tell you, no, we're still getting screwed over, and then the one or two people you have in litigation tries to follow up. I mean, it's not enough that you wrote the, with all due respect, I mean, this is, is it not concerning to you as well? Absolutely, council member. We've resolved the issues. The court ruled against the tenants. This is a long um, history that we're happy to explain to you um, all of the the issues that arise of this affordable building. housing. I mean, I, I, in a way, don't care what the court said. Our job in government is to keep people out of homeless shelters, right? Keep people off the street. And, and we just want to hear, you know, even when something doesn't go in the favor of a, a low-income, moderate-income tenant, it doesn't matter. What, are the, what is the city doing to keep people in their homes? And... I, I'm not hearing that passion. So we have done, and our code enforcement and our folks have done everything for this building and for this tenant. That is that, and so we're happy to talk offline about what we've done and what we continue to do, and um, where where the issues, if there are any issues, whether they are right. But I'm not just talking about that building. I mean, I mean, we just gave. Well, that's the tax incentive for me. Yeah, but it's sort of, you know, issuing regulations to a building owner who is not interested in reading those building reg mm. regulations, they're, they don't care. Mm. So are you sending out, are you working with the tenants? Okay, My, I don't want to just so, go in. Uh, council but, member, I, I mean, really, just, I really appreciate. Take this offline, but it seems like a real issue to me. 
I, don't know. I appreciate um, where you're coming from. We have the same feelings. We have done all the enforcement work um, on behalf of the tenants in this property, um, and we're happy to let you know what we've done and how, we, how we've resolved it. We also have our, and, and um, you know, with council member um, Chin's issue, it's a tax incentives issue, and we have a proposal that we're going to work through with the council member and with HCR to preserve affordability. But with regard to Decatur, um, we have done what the city um, should do by those tenants, and we're happy to discuss that offline. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to your staff. Um, thank you, colleagues. That's it. <laughs> thank you, council member. I'm going to be calling the um, the panels of the public. Phoebe Flaherty, Flaherty, Chris Lilo, Kush Cam Ao, Vivian Gordon, Ruth McDaniel's. Tawati Kamatsu. It's one panel. Yeah, I'm calling them all. Please, if you heard your name, please address, um, please begin to make your way towards the table. I'll try those names again. Mr. Kamatsu. Ruth McDaniels. Vivian Gordon. Kush Cam Ao. Yes? No? Chris Tilu. Phoebe Flaherty. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to identify yourself for the record, and you can begin testifying in any um, sequence you'd like. Um, we're we're going to have a uh, two-minute clock. Just give me one second, please. You can, you can begin whenever you'd like. Good afternoon. My name is Ruth McDaniels, and I'm from Harlem. And I'm here with response to this housing budget because it, it, it's pressing on my mind. As you spoke so eloquently about the six children that you had in your home who are definitely on par with where they should be in society, I, too, am faced with that, that reality. I have five children and two Two have graduated college, and one is getting ready to go to college, and then the next year another one is going to college, and they've all played the game. And I'm concerned. I also have a son who's incarcerated, who, who should be getting a college degree when he was out here, but he'll be returning home. And I have a real concern as to where they're going to live. I'm not from the South. I'm from the West Indies, and I'm not trying to go back to the West Indies. I've been in Harlem for 55 years, and I need to know where are they are going to live. All of my children are employed. They're employed and they're making $15 an hour, and they don't even get enough hours to complete 30 hours a week. So now, how does that process into housing? The average medium income in my area is $88,000 a year. You know they're not giving them that. They can't stay with me forever. I want to know how can we speak to the medium income? How can we speak to the housing as a crisis? You don't have to be homeless. To, to need housing. That should not be the requirement to get put on a list for housing that you could afford. I mean, housing, 
how should I put it? Homelessness is trauma. Why do you need to be traumatized to be housed? That should be an easy fix. I need you all to work on this, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Cornegie. My name is Chris Widello. I'm the Director of External Affairs for NYSAFA, the New York State Association for Affordable Housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good to see you as always, uh, Chairwoman Chin. Um, NYSAFA represents the affordable housing trade in industry. We have about 375 or more uh, members that make uh, their attorneys, architects, developers, for nonprofit developers, lenders, and operators of affordable housing. I uh, wanted just to uh, t talk about a few things today. I think there's no surprise that we need to increase the supply of affordable housing across the city um, if we are going to meet the needs of uh, the current and future population here in the city. And, um, you know, the affordable housing industry certainly stands ready to, uh, to help in that and uh, certainly would like to be at the table for conversations around um, the production of affordable housing throughout the city. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to note um, and, and applaud the Department of Buildings for their the continued effectiveness of the New York uh, City Development Hub. Um, I think if we're going to build the kind of affordable housing New York City needs uh, to address this housing crisis, we need to uh, have a process that complements those goals. And the Development Hub is a valuable program and a shining example of the interagency coordination throughout the planning and review of affordable housing projects. So. Uh, a really great program that uh, would like to certainly needs to continue here in the city. Um, wanted to just also uh, touch upon two other things. Uh, you know, I, I think we, we're really excited for what HPD, the mayor and the council, um, are doing in working towards uh, production of affordable housing. And I think a, a good example is the Sunnyside Yards. Um, uh, announcement over earlier in this week, uh, producing, you know, when completed, it will have over 12,000 units of affordable housing. Um, and I think that that is uh, this, the forward thinking that we need if we are going to uh, address this crisis head on. And lastly, uh, one of the, the things that the affordable housing industry is focused on right now is around sustainability and making sure that uh, our housing will uh, be green and, and leave uh, as small of a footprint as possible on our, on our, uh, on our, um, on the earth here. And so, uh, you know, I think a great example is uh, Beach Green Dunes Phase 2 in Far Rockaway, which opened a couple weeks ago. It's 100% affordable. There's 127 units, and it uh, meets passive house standards. In addition, it is using, um, its cooling is provided, uh, you know, by using geothermal technologies. And I think this is the type of, uh, you know, the way that we need to be moving if we are going to meet the needs of, of the society, but also the goals of, uh, uh, you know, 80 by 50 um, um, uh, initiative that the council passed and the mayor signed into law a couple, uh, about a year ago. So in conclusion, um, just want to uh, just uh, uh, reiterate that, uh, you know, the housing industry is certainly um, ready to keep moving forward to make sure that we can produce the housing needed for the city. Thank you. Uh, I want to cite that we've been joined by Larry Thompson at the panel. That didn't mean you could go, Larry. You just got here. No, it, however. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to testify, council members. Uh, my name is Phoebe Flaherty. I'm an organizer at Align, the Alliance for Greater New York. Align is a community labor coalition dedicated to creating good jobs, vibrant communities, and accountable democracy for all New Yorkers. We co-coordinate the Climate Works for All Coalition, a coalition of environmental justice groups, labor, and community organizations, all working towards reducing emissions to fight climate change through the lens of a just transition. We recently worked with council members um, to pass the Dirty Buildings Bill, Local Law 97. We're in the midst of a climate crisis, and we only have a few years left to take aggressive action to slow and try to stop the effects of climate change. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's 2018 report, we could arrive at irreversible climate change as soon as 2030. We have no time to waste. The city has made a laudable commitment to lower emissions and has taken aggressive steps to meet the, those emissions goals through the passage of Local Law 97, which mandates most buildings above 25,000 square feet reduce emissions leading up to 2050. However, meeting our broader citywide commitments will require continued effort. We must invest in the implementation of Local Law 97 and go beyond its reach if we are to meet our emissions reductions goals. 
the Climate Works for All Coalition is asking the City Council to allocate $1 billion annually to retrofit affordable and public housing. Buildings with rent regulated and affordable units were exempted um, from the law to protect tenants who would face increased costs uh, from displacement. But those buildings make up 50% of residential housing stock and therefore represent a large percentage of citywide GHG emissions. We cannot allow these buildings to continue to emit emissions at their current rates and still meet our emissions goals. We must also ensure that benefits of retrofits from more comfortable homes to decreased localized pollution that leads to asthma and other health, health issues occurs equitably across New York City. Tenants of affordable and public housing in New York City deserve clean air and comfortable homes as much as all other tenants. Without additional funding, we are in danger of not meeting our emissions reductions goals, and meeting those goals is crucial to the future of the city and the world. We are asking the City Council and the Mayor to fund retrofits in public and affordable housing in New York City. Fighting climate change must be our top priority for now and for the years to come before it's too late. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the 1,000 New Yorkers who are living in incredibly underfunded NYCHA buildings and low-income housing units. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll give you more time, but I just need you to state your name for the record. Oh, sorry, I was getting teleported. Uh, Kush Camus from a Community Service Society. Uh, my name is Kush Camus, and I'm the campaign liaison at the Community Service Society of New York. Um, CSS uses a multifaceted approach to attack income inequality in New York. CSS has been at the forefront of this work for more than 175 years, changing our strategy and focus as the times demand. We engage in policy work, legislative um, advocacy, impactful and folk, um, direct services programs and legis um, litigation in order to help create a fairer, stronger New York. As members of Just Leadership USA's Build Communities campaign, CSS wants all communities um, to be safe, well-resourced, and have a strong sense of stability. I want to use my time today to highlight two planks in the Bills Community platform. The first is to create, preserve, and maintain true affordable housing throughout New York City that is accessible to all. There are many ways to make sure this happens. One is through removing the barriers people face with criminal records and a history of justice involvement when finding and keeping housing by passing the Fair Chance for Housing Act. This act, which is similar to legislation Seattle and Oakland have implemented, will require questions about prior convictions to be removed from housing applications so individuals can have rapid access to housing. Without stable housing, no reentry gains are possible. You cannot hold down a job, provide for your family, or participate in your community without a home. Another is through investing at least $1.5 in NYCHA for the purpose of taking care of deferred maintenance that plagues NYCHA buildings and for, make lo for making long overdue improvements. New Yorkers who live in public housing face the consequences of underfunded and under-maintained buildings on a daily basis. Second, I would like to place focus on Bill Community's um, demand for expanding and improving services that help people to stay in their homes. CSS supported and urged passage of Right to Council legislation in 2017. Uh, quickly. Our research since then shows that the law's implementation has shown that providing legal representation and assistance to New Yorkers has played a crucial role for reducing rates of, ev of eviction and zip codes where Right to Council has been rolled out. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. I have a question for you. The, um, in your testimony, you talked about um, all criminal involvement not being involved in the application process. Uh, just explain that. To yes. Uh, the, the question in regards to um, criminal involvement being removed from the application process um, as a whole, uh, similarly to ban the box and other processes where um, questions around criminal conviction and um, records. Um, RAs, we're asking in regards to housing, especially affordable housing, low-income housing, that that um, application question be removed entirely. Uh, um, I'm curious, though, some of, mm. some of the involvement is in direct correlation to the safety mm. of individuals. Are you, are you considering, in your testimony, excluding uh, violent crime, excluding um, um, uh, Relationships with minors, are you or just everything? There should be no way to articulate whether or not someone is has the potential. Um, as a fair chance um, act around housing is worked out, we're hoping that people fine tune uh, the credentials for folks who this will apply for. But for the time being, we're asked that the barriers that involve people who have criminal records be removed, in which the degree of which your criminal involvement is not even brought up or mentioned or held as a barrier to getting housing. Okay, thank you. 
Good afternoon, um, Chairman Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Viviana Gordon, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Red Hook Community Justice Center in Brooklyn, where I oversee our Housing Resource Center. The Resource Center serves litigants in our housing court and residents of the Red Hook Houses, which is the largest NYCHA development in Brooklyn. Uh, the Justice Center is a project of the Center for Court Innovation, which works to create more effective and humane justice system. Three center programs in particular, the Reddick Justice Center, the Harlem Community Justice Center, and Legal Hand work directly with New York City residents who are facing housing instability. I'm here to request support from the council for three applications we've submitted under the Community Housing Preservation Strategies Initiative. Both Justice Centers in Reddick and Harlem operate neighborhood-based housing courts in partnership with the court system. Harlem handles public and private housing from two local zip codes, and Red Hook, we handle exclusively public housing cases from Red Hook East and West. Our Legal Hand project handles, aids thousands of New Yorkers with housing issues in communities of Brownsville, Crown Heights, Highbridge, Tremont, and Jamaica. Taken together, our work serving tenants in both court and community settings, we've learned a great deal about preventing eviction, enforcing the city's housing code for tenants in need of cr critical home repairs, addressing the human needs of litigants beyond just the legal needs, expanding access to justice, and advancing fairness in housing court. I just want to share one example of our work in Red Hook where we are altering the reality of housing court as the landlord's home court in transforming it to a place where tenants can seek justice. Housing courts are not set up to be tenant friendly, and yet for NYCHA residents, an HP action or court order is the only way to obtain a city inspection. In Red Hook and Harlem, we've made the housing court experience more accessible. Tenants in Red Hook have increasingly come to court to file HP's, HP actions on housing maintenance issues, including health hazards of lead paint, mold, and chronic leaks. Citywide, Tenant-initiated HP actions comprise less than 6% of court filings. Last year in Red Hook, HP actions comprised 34% of our housing court filings and resulted in over 800 cited city code violations, which has uh, exposed the significant unmet capital needs. Tenant-driven court actions, may I continue for 30 more seconds? Thank you. Um, Tenant-driven court actions allow households with severe emergency repairs to take NYCHA to court and restore safety and habitability in their home and provides localized accountability for code compliance to the city's largest landlord. Furthermore, tracking code violations, um, which are not uh, available in public record, allows our Housing Resource Center to identify systemic trends, such as the need for plumbers and NYCHA, and the correlation between chronic leaks and lead paint exposure, resulting from delays in obtaining skilled trade dates. Um, we, the City Council support has been invaluable to our success at the Center for Court Innovation in the past. Uh, we respectfully ask for your continued support um, through the Community Housing Preservation Strategies Initiative. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, how are we all doing today? My name is Lyric Thompson, and I am a tenant in 1355 Decatur, the building that Louise Carroll was sitting right here lying her face off over. We evidently have very different definitions of taking care of. Our saga began in 2015 when our landlord tried to clear our, build, clear our building. We had no idea that we were rent stabilized because HPD at that time, along with finance, had agreed to informally ignore the rule that said you had to have two final approved certificates of eligibility before you got tax exemptions. So what Decatur Assets did in our case was they bought a building that was incomplete. Sonia Lugo, the woman that was constructing this building, sadly died halfway through construction. It was never completed. It was thrown together by her children, which I, I'm sure you remember my seven inch slit closet. That's how we got a seven inch slit closet with a full size door. When Decatur Assets purchased the building, they obtained a CFO from Artan Majuko and Gordon Holder, two corrupt DOB inspectors that were busted for signing off incomplete buildings in 2015 by DOI. He forged a forged and notarized Sonia Lugo's signature, then submitted it to HPD. HPD gave him the tax exemption and did nothing but send notices about registration because the man never registered. 
Fast forward to 2015, I find out, wow, we have rights. We're a rent-stabilized building. Unfortunately, he had already cleared a tenant out of the building via a holdover, Olga Ortiz. He subsequently went on to forge leases to fiend that he never evicted Olga Ortiz. I forwarded them to Louise Carroll. She said it was very sad. Evidently not sad enough to do anything about it, but that wasn't the only forgery, and the dead lady forgery wasn't the only forgery in our 421A application. The architectural signature is forged. HPD, when they sit here and say, we've taken care of it, there's a seal, as if a seal cannot be fraudulently obtained. The public accountant's papers are forged. These numbers are what HPD is using six years later to recalculate our rent, but they wish to claim statute of limitations. They can't do anything about this fraudulent uh, filing. If they bothered to read the rules they were supposed to enforce, they would see that pursuant to Title 28, Chapter 39, there is no statute of limitations. HPD can remove an exemption from a shady developer at any time for misrepresentation. The permits they submitted to HPD to demonstrate our building. Council member, do we have a laundry facility downstairs as stated on our plans? No. We have a rotten, moldy basement. <laughs> HPD doesn't care. They know all of this. The leases they submitted to HPD to feign that they were in compliance after I got kind of testy in 2015, and ProPublica published a story about our building in 2016. Oh, they feign compliance. How many forgeries are too many for my city? And why is my city engaging in criminal activity or covering up criminal activity? Larry, do me a favor. What I want you to do on record yes. is, is give me the specific things that you want HPD to hear because, unfortunately, uh, the, commission, the commission is gone. Oh, yeah, she ran from here. She, she had offered to have I, a sit I, down afterwards, but then she So I need, I need you to get the most important things on the record, and then I will get a meeting with you and her and me. I would like my building finished. I'd like the heating reinstalled in my building. HPD has an unwritten policy regarding common area heating in buildings. They don't think you're entitled to it, so hack it out. That's what they told my landlord. They said it right in front of me. They said it to Councilmember Espinal's office. They said it to Celeste Leon and Community Board 4. They, they've said it to me in writing. Anne-Marie Santiago has written this. I'd like that heating installed because, you see, the thing is, Councilmember, is that hacking out that heating system wasn't just removing the heating. Our plumbing is intertwined. It was creating situations like what we have in the bathroom downstairs in our unfinished moldy, rotten basement at this point. It's created gas leaks. It's created plumbing issues. So what I would like is I would like this building brought up to architectural standards, as it should be. I would like the person who submitted all those forged documents to go to prison, because we have laws, to, we have laws that penalize people that do crimes because we don't want them to continue doing those crimes. However, when Louise Carroll and HPD just ignores them, it allows that person to continue that crime. You see, what this guy did was Decatur Assets drop sold our building to uh, some other guy who is right now trying to use those forgeries in our Supreme Court case. Isn't that lovely? Forgeries that I told Louise Carroll about and she knows about. So, so let, me, let me ask you this. Have you attempted to get a meeting with the commissioner of HPD? Um, I, have, <laughs> I have tried to contact, I've contacted HPD hundreds of times. So, Hundreds of what, times. so what I'm telling you, in the absence of uh, Councilmember Espinal, uh, uh, I will double down because I don't know when that seat will be filled, and I will broker a meeting between you, I, and her. I had the displeasure of actually coming to visit. You were a pleasure to visit, but your building was not a pleasure to see. Thank you. Um, uh, both myself and Raphael, and now Raphael is um, Councilmember Espinal is no longer in office, so I will take up that slack. And, I, and I appreciate it, and the tenants appreciate it. I mean, we want resolve. The easiest thing, you see, what should have happened was as soon as HPD found these forgeries, what they should have done, rather than concealing them and covering them up, was drag this guy on the carpet. You pull him into the carpet because he's not only doing this in this building. I would also like to go ahead and make the council aware of 1660 Broadway. This was another building I told Louise Carroll about in 2016. 
They hadn't at that point registered with DHCR, and they still haven't registered with DHCR. I believe they're in year, what, 13 or 14 of 25? Well, so they're in the interest of time, because I really want to get your situation resolved. I had a chance to personally witness what, yes, you're, what you've experienced. If I can just ask you at the, if you could just speak to my chief of staff so we can get a, a date and time on the books for us to meet with Louise Carroll. I would very much appreciate that. If you promise me to behave in that meeting. I'll be nice. I will broker the meeting. I will be nice. Okay, as so, long as she tells the truth. Uh, see, that's, you got to negotiate this afterwards then. But thank you for your testimony. I always appreciate it. Your advocacy, not only for yourself, but for people in similar conditions is important for this council to do its work. So I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate what, you're, you what, what you're doing. I look forward to working, for, working with you. Okay, so we're gonna, you're gonna talk to my chief as soon as, Yep. and, and we'll, we'll get a time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank we have the next panel coming, which is, yeah. Mr. Komatsu. Ariel Hirsch, Garciella Blandin, I'm sure. Uh, Shelby Fredrickson. I didn't call her. Shelby. Oh, Burnell Greer, I'm sorry. Uh, Ariel Hirsch? Okay. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I ask again is for the record, if you can state your name prior to your testimony. Um, I'm asking in the interest of time, we have a couple more panels to go, if people could try to stay in the framework of the two minutes, which means that if you could condense and get your, your, your very pertinent points out, it would, be, it would be helpful. I know everybody's passionate about what's happening in their particular lives. If you could just highlight the points that you would want HPD to hear and that you would want on the record, I would appreciate that. It would be beneficial for everybody. So you can begin uh, when and wherever you like. Hi, this is Ariel Hirsch. Um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ariel Hirsch, and I'm here on behalf of UHAB, the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board. For 45 years, UHAB has been creating in preserving and supporting resident controlled housing as well as tenant associations to build leadership, democratic participation, and community through cooperation. Uh, you have as part of the Climate Works for All campaign um, because HDFC communities are on the front lines of the climate crisis. Most HDFC residents are disproportionately impacted by the legacies of redlining, neighborhood dis disinvestment, and aging building conditions. Furthermore, many HDFC buildings are in the areas of the city most vulnerable to rising sea levels and increasingly powerful storms like Superstorm Sandy. We are calling for the city to allocate $1 billion annually to retrofit buildings that were left out of Local Law 97 because we cannot fight climate change without the affordable housing community. We are grateful for the strides the city has already made to fund energy efficiency and retrofit programs for affordable housing, but this progress still falls short. It is nowhere near the city's own stated goals um, and the reality of the impending climate crisis. Residents and owners of affordable housing cannot be left behind in this fight. They are the ones on the front lines of climate change, and they need to be at the table to guide us through a just transition to a more sustainable future. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. My name is uh, Graciela Blanton. I'm an NYU student here, also with Climate Works for All, an alliance of community and labor. Uh, United for a Just and Sustainable New York. Uh, I'd like to highlight that our coalition is led by young people, and I'm here to reiterate the calls to action of the youth internationally, because we're running out of time to delay the existential threat that is the climate emergency. 
Uh, whatever issues you think the city of New York has now will pale in comparison to the pandemonium wrought by our current negligence to sustainability efforts. Uh, my generation is disheartened by the lack of urgency with which resources have been allocated to emergency preventative and restorative measures. Uh, we are here fighting for equity for marginalized communities who have been forgotten in localized efforts to slow climate change and we are here fighting for tenants so that their housing may be sustainable. And some we're here to demand that $1 billion is spent annually for 10 years to retrofit affordable housing and public housing left out of Local Law 97. This ambitious investment in our community is both the least we can do and in line with the spirit of New Yorkers. We have never been a population to back down from becoming global leaders. Local Law 97 was only the beginning in New York City's pursuit of aggressive and uncompromising resiliency efforts. These retrofits must occur equitably across New York City in order to have the strongest impact. Funding from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority has remained inaccessible to too many for too long, and we cannot afford a lack of funding when prescri prescriptive measures still may not even happen without financial support. For the sake of the city, the planet, and your moral conscience, conscience I ask that this committee reaffirm its commitment to leading in ecological housing development by allocating $1 billion over 10 years for retrofitting affordable housing in an equitable manner. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, my name is Shelby Fredrickson. I'm here speaking on behalf of Pratt Center for Community Development, also in support of Climate Works for All Coalition's call for a $1 billion retrofit fund to ensure a just transition for the residents of New York City's affordable housing stock. Recognizing how low-income communities and communities of color have been denied access to the benefits of energy efficiency, Pratt Center has been advocating for energy efficiency policies and piloting programs that can ensure these communities are no longer excluded. Not only have these communities borne the burden of years of inequitable energy policy, but without clear and directed action, they now face the potential to yet again be left behind by the Climate Mobilization Act. The Local Law 97 Affordable Housing Carve-Out was designed with the correct intention to limit displacement uh, pressure on tenants. But without public intervention, all the benefits that come with increasing a building's energy efficiency, such as reducing the burden of high energy bills, improving indoor air quality and home health and safety will not be accessible to the tenants of these buildings. As a city, a limited and an equitable approach is not an acceptable solution. We will not meet the goals of 80 by 50 if we do not greatly reduce emissions across all building types, no matter how complicated. We cannot rely on the goodwill of the private sector. We cannot rely on current utility and state incentive programs that have proven to be less than effective in pushing the affordable housing retrofit market forward in New York City. This is why we are calling on the city to invest $1 billion annually to retrofit buildings with vulnerable tenants who deserve to benefit from a building retrofit, both in larger and smaller affordable housing. Homeowners cannot afford to do this on their own, and landlords likely won't. Superstorm Sandy costs the city $19 billion in damages and 44 lives. $1 billion a year for ensuring we are equitable in mitigating our building's impacts on climate change while reducing the potential of future costly disasters is a small price to pay for an investment in our future. We urge the City Council to fund a just transition. Thank you for your time. My name is Tawaki. Oh, sorry. My name is Tawaki Komatsu. This is a public hearing. Um, however, what I see in front of me are empty seats. So with regards to due process, I'm left wondering, where is it? Um, Ms. Chin, you're here, but where are your colleagues? Mr. Cornegie just exited the room in spite of the fact that we have a First Amendment and 14th Amendment right to be heard at a meaningful time instead of seeing empty seats in front of us. Your testimony will be on record. That's not the same. Um, I'm currently contending with a frivolous uh, housing court proceeding where I previously beat that slumlord um, through a decision that was issued in November of last year. It then filed yet another frivolous lawsuit against me where it essentially committed mail fraud by doing so. So there's been some discussion today in this room about forgery. Um, HRA actually forged my lease agreement two days after I signed it in HRA's offices. I talked to Mr. Cornegie about that fact in a public hearing just like this. He told me that I would get assistance. He lied. I didn't get assistance. Instead, 
I got 15 punches to my left temple on July 2nd in that building only because of the fact I had a roommate that I was never supposed to have and that occurred after an attempted assault. So the question is if HRA extended its contract with Urban Pathways, that landlord, as a council member, as a lawmaker, what can you do to make sure that the, the, the money in your wallet stays in your wallet instead of going to Urban Pathways that is responsible for me getting a concussion from those 15 punches? Also, um, this is a segment from the audio transcript of that court hearing in March of 2019 in that housing court case that I prevailed in before Urban filed yet another frivolous court case against me. Um, some, sorry, something's wrong with my laptop. I'll summarize it for you. The housing court judge basically said he didn't have jurisdiction to determine whether there was an invalid lease at play. Instead, he said that a, a New York Supreme Court judge would need to uh, examine that. In spite of the, however, he still allowed Urban to file yet another frivolous lawsuit against me. So, bottom line to close out, what can you do for people like me that are contending with bait and switch? Um, fraud and forgeries with lease agreements that are perpetrated by HRA and its business partners. Can we talk about your case um, after the hearing? Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll have a staff that will talk to you and then also to see if we can help you find legal representation or, or get more information. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bernell Greer, the Executive Director of Impact Brooklyn. I also serve on the board of ANHD, the Joint Ownership Entity, as well as the New York Housing Conference. So first of all, I happened to be in the neighborhood and decided to stop by. Um, one, to thank you, to thank the council for their efforts in terms of supporting Stabilize NYC. Um, as I've heard quite a few of the people here speaking today about you know, needing assistance through last year, the city council was able to expand our reach with Stabilize NYC, increasing the amount of money, and we were able to add two groups to have further outreach where there's unscrupulous landlords and being able to fight. We're asking for another 100,000 to be added to the three million that was provided last year into this year's budget, and so being able to move that forward. I also served on the task force that Robert Carnegie had put together in regards to the third party transfer and really wanting to be able to see within the city's budget and support for home ownership opportunities for people that are living in HDFCs um, and just being able to have that ownership as a way to stay um, gentrification. Lastly, we have found that through the housing lottery system that there is an opportunity for job creation and almost like an apprentice program to be able to train people how to manage the lotteries for a lot of the different developers that are running lotteries across the city and being able to have that be a pipeline to jobs within the overall industry. So with that, again, in stopping by, just wanted to make those three points and um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony. Do we have another panel? Uh, Premier Mogarha? Oh, Mo Gallagher, okay. Taver um, Tavern, Lewis. Oh, sure. Sonia, Jesse. Hannah from Cypress Hill Local Development Corp. How do you pronounce your well, last name? Anusha, okay, and uh, Teresa Algarin, Algarin, five, right, one, two, three, four, five. Great, good afternoon. Yes, Council you could Ma begin. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, Council Member Chin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Priya Mulgaukar. I'm the Resiliency Planner at the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a citywide network linking 11 grassroots organizations from low-income communities and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. 
Today, I'm here to testify in support of the Climate Works for All Coalition demand for the Climate and Community Development Fund, a $1 billion allocation in this year's budget and in every budget for the next 10 years to address energy efficiency in low-income, rent-stabilized, and affordable housing. New York has less than 10 years to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which will require rapid and equitable investment in every single building in our city and an unwavering and substantial financial commitment in the city budget. We commend the City Council for passing Local Law 97, the Climate Mobilization Act, in 2019, which mandates energy efficiency retrofits in most of our large polluting buildings. With buildings accounting for 67% of all greenhouse gas emissions in our city, Local Law 97 sets a bold and necessary mandate to help tackle the escalating risk of climate change and the adverse public health impacts. Yet, however ambitious this legislation may be, the fact remains that it only covers about 50,000 of our city's over 1 million buildings. Local Law 97 exempts rent-stabilized and affordable housing from mandatory retrofits, which are instead only given prescriptive measures to avoid the cost being passed off to vulnerable tenants in the form of major capital improvements, which could lead to displacement. This will leave a significant portion of New York City's housing stock struggling to achieve energy efficiency and reducing energy burden. We believe the City Council should fund the CCDF for the following reasons. Every single city council district in New York is home to some form of public, rent-regulated, or government-assisted housing, collectively housing over 3 million people. Affordable, rent-regulated, and public housing tends to require a higher baseline of consumption of energy than their market rate counterparts. These buildings tend to be older, less efficient, and in disrepair. Thus, investing in increased efficiency will be essential to achieving our city's 80 by 50 climate goals. New York needs a large-scale, city-funded energy efficiency program to help improve and, and preserve affordable and public housing. Energy efficiency is also key to increasing community resiliency. Tenants of rent-stabilized, affordable, and public housing tend to be low-income people of color, residing in areas of high heat vulnerability, made worse due to lack of access to green space. These tenants also pay a much higher proportion of their income on energy costs. On hot days when everyone is running their air conditioning, the most heat vulnerable communities are susceptible to blackouts and brownouts, meaning losing power when it's needed most. By providing direct investments, the city will help improve and preserve the affordable housing stock, which is essential to maintaining the vibrant diversity of our city. We urge the city council to make 2020 the year of the climate budget and invest in preserving and climatizing our valuable affordable housing stock. Thank you. Thank you. We also want to invite up Jackie Del Valley. Please continue. Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilmember Cornegie and Councilmember Chin. Um, thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, my name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at We Act for Environmental Justice. Um, over the past 32 years, We Act has been combating environmental racism in northern Manhattan. I'm here as a member of the Climate Works for All Coalition, and I'm testifying to demand more funding for action to address our climate emergency. As we know, climate change is an issue that has and will affect all New Yorkers. It's important to always act with climate justice framework, that climate change impacts low-income communities and communities of color first and worst. For example, frequency, severity, and duration of the extremely hot days has risen significantly in New York City. Low-income neighborhoods of color are most impacted by health effects of extreme heat due to a number of reasons, such as lack of adequate access to cooling, higher rates of chronic conditions that increase vulnerability, and more. WEAC joins the Climate Works for All Coalition and stands with New York City community members, labor groups, environmental justice communities to demand to fund our future by funding equitable climate action for all New Yorkers. Last year we passed Local Law 7, which was very exciting and moved us towards meeting our climate goals. Um, this year we're asking to allocate $1 billion annually to retrofit buildings that were left out of that law to ensure that we fight climate change as aggressively but as equitably as possible. This billion dollar budget allocation will have immediate impact on job creation, community revitalization, and the climate. With this allocation, New York City will be a leader in the fight for climate action, not only in the United States, but around the world. We act as enthusiastic to see the successful implementation of Local Law 97. However, we believe that we must expand retrofitting to affordable and low-income housing left out of the Local Law 97 and fund it, because NYSERDA funding is inaccessible. People living in affordable housing deserve to have energy-efficient homes that will benefit their health and well-being while also reducing emissions. 
Expanding retrofitting and funding it is key for ensuring equity in the city's climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts. Allocating more funding to retrofit New York City is important action because we all know that buildings is the city's number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, retrofitting for affordable housing will promote equity in our city's fight. Um, so going back to my example about extreme heat, low income residents often have hundreds of dollars per month in utility bills. I know this because I have spoken to them hundreds of times, but only receive a tenth of that per year in bill assistance for cooling, for example. All in all, New York City must be aggressive in action to slow climate change. Local Law 97 is an important, significant step, but we know it's just the beginning. It's important that Committee on Housing and Buildings align Local Law 97 work with other initiatives to combat the climate crisis, like funding affordable housing retrofitting. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Building. My name is Torian Lewis, and I'm a fourth generation Brownsvillian. I offer this testimony in support of the Citywide Community Land Trust Initiative on behalf of Community Solutions and its local initiative, the Brownsville Partnership, where I'm the Community Engagement Specialist. Before I do, I'd like to share a quick quote with you. All power comes from the land, while all absolute power comes from God. These prophetic words spoken by Charles Sherrard in the movie Ark of Justice served as a spark of the community land trust movement that began over 50 years ago. Today, the land is fully protected and serves as a functioning farm, market, educational institution that is self-sufficient and whose vision can be summed in three words, preserve, farm, culture. At the heart of this inspiring story, it speaks about one community's perseverance to protect one of its most important assets, its land. Now, we all know that New York City is an extremely expensive city for renters and homeowners alike. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, where my organization is based, there are real fears of gentrification, as Brownsville is one of the last communities that hasn't been. We are venturing to establish a community land trust with the support of enterprise, excuse me, Enterprise Community Partners, the New Economy Project, and HPD, whose vision builds upon the goals and strategies of the Brownsville Plan. Within Brownsville's 1.2 square mile radius exists 200 plus vacant lots where nearly 900,000 unbuilt square feet could produce 1,500 plus dwelling units. If combined with new community facilities used to support important service delivery around health, education, and workforce development, these sites could produce even more valuable square footage to utilize for its local stakeholders. Despite the ultimate aim of repurposing this land as housing whose affordability is perpetually protected and sustainable, our broader goal is to strengthen the capacity of the community-based organizations that wish to remain in Brownsville and invest in the people that make it the special place that it is for so many, for generations, at least five. I know because I'm fifth generation. Um, I says fourth, but I'm fifth generation. This was the vision of our founder, former New York Nick Gregory Jackson, which centered on community mobilization to build the local infrastructure to support the collective problem solving around Brownsville's most complex challenges. Through a new Brownsville CLT, Community Solutions and its community partners would endeavor to influence the ongoing discourse around community development and investment. As our mission and focus is to create and preserve permanently affordable, community-guided housing for extremely low to moderate income households in the Brownsville and neighboring Ocean Hill communities. It would also utilize the CLT local ownership framework to steward key large-scale pipeline projects that, one, promote mixed-use corridors, two, foster neighborhood-level financial empowerment by connecting Brownsville residents to jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities, and three, improve social and physical connections in the neighborhood in and around its 18 public housing campuses. In October 2018, the Brownsville Partnership devoted its annual Hope Summit to kick off a community education campaign to inform residents of the concept and identify critical values to inform its design. And in February 2019, a 12-member resident-led advisory board was established, the Brownsville Neighborhood Empowerment Network, or BNEN. The group, which will grow to become the formal planning advisory committee for the Brownsville CLT, are experienced in assisting community residents with solving housing-related problems for themselves and others, while building awareness of the land trust through the, through the neighborhood, 
being in members help residents act on any issues threatening the stability of their housing. This peer-led approach to housing stability is a distinct and intentional departure from traditional case management and service delivery models for supporting members. In 2020, the BNIM will work alongside the Brownsville Partnership team to complete the launch of the BVCLT while continuing to educate residents and community stakeholders on community land trust. With that being said, we appreciate the Council's support in the fiscal year 2020 budget as community land trusts are a sustainable alternative crucial to combating speculation and predatory equity-driven tenant displacement. Your support will also provide a means to resist the continued movement of publicly owned lands into the private sector and will provide CLTs the opportunity to educate and empower communities to solve local problems and achieve community-driven goals, creating a less exploitative housing system to preserve sustainable affordability. Your continued support in the fiscal year 2021 budget of CLTs will help communities reclaim their most valuable land assets while providing much needed stewardship and oversight to guide their long-term investment and also facilitate the opportunity for all 15 members within the citywide CLT initiative to leverage and possibly expand their staff and resources that will enable some to move forward in acquiring property for development and also will help Sorry, no, that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, committee chair Carnegie and council member Chin. Um, my name is Hannah Anouche and I'm the community land trust coordinator at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. Um, CHLDC is a nonprofit organization based in Cypress Hills, East New York. And um, we provide comprehensive services to more than 11,000 Cypress Hills and East New York residents each year through college access, youth education and leadership programs, as well as workforce development and housing counseling. And CHLDC also has developed um, 417 units of affordable rental and home ownership units in Community Board 5. Um, and so CHLDC and 14 partner organizations are part of a citywide community land trust initiative that seeks 1.5 million in city council discretionary funding for fiscal year 2021 to develop CLTs as well as permanently affordable housing, commercial space, and other community needs. Um, and we ask that the committee recommend funding for the CLT initiative for fiscal year 2021's budget. Um, so, we know that CLTs are a proven model to combat speculation and displacement, protect public subsidy, and facilitate, facilitate community-led development. And we really appreciate the City Council's support for CLTs in the 2020 budget. Um, in 2018, CHLDC was awarded 12 lots from HPD through the new Infill Homeownership Opportunities Program. Um, and, um, t and, um, through that, we're, we're building two to three family co-op buildings, and we want to put those lots into a community land trust. And so with the funding last year, we were able to hire, to hire a community land trust coordinator and begin working with local residents to create a CLT in East New York. Um, and since November, we've been holding CLT workshops twice a month and are build a, building a dedicated and energetic steering committee of residents to move this project forward. Um, fiscal year 2021 discretionary funding will, out, will allow us to build on this momentum and move towards incorporating the East New York CLT. And after that, CHLDC can transfer the lots from HPD into the CLT to get it off the ground. And the CLT can look towards acquiring more properties to get to a sustainable scale. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, committee member Carnegie and deputy leader Chin. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Teresa Elguera, and I'm here in support of Climate Works for All's proposal. I come to the hearing as a parent of young climate activists and also as a middle-class homeowner who's had the privilege of affording the installation of solar panels and other energy-efficient items in my own home. As the city debates whether to provide additional funds to simultaneously address climate change and preserve low-income housing, the logic is irrefutable, both can and must be done. The city has a lot to gain from such an investment in a variety of ways. 
the creation of new green jobs, which would train and employ people to participate in a green economy as they work to address the climate crisis, the preservation and improvement of low-income housing and mitigating ever-increasing homelessness by keeping costs down, and reaping economic gains from the investment in infrastructure. As a homeowner, I can confidently tell you that every investment in energy efficiency saves me money. We reduce our costs and don't need to raise the rent on our friends who live upstairs. With the support of funding by district to tackle this problem systematically with larger groupings of buildings, the savings would be even greater. By allocating $1 billion annually over the next 10 years, you have the opportunity to take a moral stance, a realistic stance, and a sustainable stance on both climate justice and homelessness in our city. I urge you to take such a stance and allocate the funding. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, council members. Um, I passed out to you copies of the Stabilizing NYC report. Um, we ran out of color copies. We gave out all 50 yesterday at our legislative briefing, but both of your staff was there and have them. Um, Stabilizing NYC is a coalition of 18 grassroots organizations, a legal service provider, and a housing advocacy organization who together combat tenant harassment and preserve affordable housing for New Yorkers who need it most. Uh, this year, we're requesting $3.1 million. Uh, last year, the council generously awarded us $3 million, and we're asking for an additional increase of $100,000 so we can protect more homes and get our two newest members um, up to par with the other groups. Um, our uh, work uh, results in an improved and well-maintained New York City housing stock that's kept affordable for working-class families. Tenant organizing creates empowered, communi empowered communities where people with various, various levels of vulnerability or marginalization, including immigration status, support each other by building relationships, learn and exercise their rights, and build agency that has been denied to them. I want to point out very critically, too, that the leadership that we've built over the past seven years in stabilizing MIC really helped lead the fight up in Albany to strengthen the rent laws, and that's had a huge impact on uh, protecting people, as you know. And I just want to say that we think that it's really of critical importance to not scale back in any way. Um, the landlord lobbies are now on the defense. Um, we're seeing some things um, where they're trying to pull, find as many loopholes as they can to pull out buildings from rent regulation. There's some warehousing going on. We're seeing what we're calling the Frankensteining of apartments, where they're kind of keeping apartment vacant and putting them together. And I think that we've built a really strong network of empowered leaders. And this, um, this initiative has really supported community organizing in a very deep way. So we just really want to encourage uh, this to keep up the level of funding with a slight increase to bring all 20 groups up to the same amount. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for your testimony, but specifically I'd like to thank uh, two organizations here who their founders and or were mentors to me. That's Michelle Nugenbauer and, and Jocko, of course. Thank you. This hearing of the fiscal 2021 budget is adjourned.